And I, and I want to first welcome you all to the uh, second day of the Alberta Rural Connectivity Forum. For those who weren't here yesterday, I'm Graham Such. I'm going to be your MC for this forum. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous people of all the lands we are on today. From all corners of this province, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. While we meet here today on a virtual platform, myself in Treaty 7 Territory and Métis Region 3, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of reconciliation and collaboration. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improve our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. A couple of housekeeping uh, announcements for those who uh, may not have been here with us yesterday. Uh, if you're having any connectivity challenges, we invite you to dial in through Zoom. We're also streaming this on Facebook Live if you uh, wish to view it that way. Uh, we also ask that for those who are joining us um, to support those who may have low bandwidth or restrictive internet plans, that you turn your cameras off unless you're in the breakout rooms or speaking. Um, and if you have any technical issues and you need support, just go to info at cybera.ca. I'd also like to take this time to thank all the members of the Alberta Rural Connectivity Coalition who have helped put this uh, together, including the uh, Rural Municipalities of Alberta, uh, the Rural Development Network, Lakeland College, the Southern Alberta Sustainable Communities Initiative, uh, Grand Yellowhead Public School Division, the Regional Economic uh, Development Alliance in Alberta, and uh, all their members, Athabasca University and IBI. And I apologize if I've missed any of some of the founding members. We've had a lot of uptake uh, in the past few months as this has emerged. So we're now going to begin our first speaker. Uh, Nirmala Naidu is the commissioner of the CRTC uh, for Alberta and Northwest Territories. Uh, many may remember uh, Commissioner Naidu as the evening news anchor for Global Calgary and CBC. Uh, she's had quite an accomplished career. She was a former speaker uh, for Enbridge's Famous Five. Uh, she was also named one of the 150 women who, uh, who helped sort of build Alberta. Uh, and uh, she's also a strong advocate on human rights and equality of power. Commissioner Naidu knows the importance of accessibility and affordable communication services and the need to represent everyone's interests. So, Commissioner, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Graham, for the introduction. I was saying I would also, before we get started, like to uh, thank the uh, people of the Treaty 7 Nation and, um, and to uh, also pay respect to the, their elders as well. Thank you for letting me be here. I appreciate it. Bon après midi. All right, so Graham, um, I'm happy to get started. If you want uh, uh, to just go through the presentation and I'll cue you to change pages, is that okay? Perfect, yeah, slides are loading up right now. All right, everyone, my name is Nirmala Naidu and I am the Commissioner of Alberta and the Northwest Territories at the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission, CRTC, as you know it. It is an honor for me to address this year's virtual event. I'll be touching on a few areas in my presentation today. I'll cover elements such as the CRTC's universal service objective, our broadband fund, as well as other areas where the CRTC is working to help close the digital divide. With that said, the COVID-19 pandemic cannot go unmentioned. In the last year, we've been managing our way through a very disruptive period of time. I believe, personally, one of the most disruptive periods any of us has ever seen, using a multitude of connected te technologies. Although some of us have continued our activities with little difference, thanks to reliable broadband internet and wireless connectivity, others have experienced a very different reality. For Canadians living in rural and remote communities, the digital divide deeply challenges their everyday life. I'll say a few words on this later, but the digital gap is not unique to Canada. The United Nations has identified increasing access to the internet as one of its goals for sustainable development across the globe. Let's go to slide two. Before I begin, I'd like to provide a brief overview of the CRTC for context. The CRTC is an arm's length administrative tribunal with quasi-judicial functions that reports to Parliament through the Minister of Canadian Heritage. Now we regulate radio, television, distribution, which includes cable, satellite, and IPTV, and telecommunications, which includes fixed and mobile wireless telephone and broadband internet access services. 
The CRTC is not responsible for spectrum allocation and does not regulate print media. Guided by its legislative mandate, the CRTC seeks to ensure that Canadians have access to a world-class communication system. The CRTC currently consists of approximately 500 staff and nine commissioners who are the so-called decision makers. The CRTC's policies and regulatory decisions are based on the evidence filed on the public record of each proceeding and are made in public interest. We routinely hold public consultations to gather the views of and evidence from interested parties on the public record. Now we, should, we also encourage Canadians to share their views through our social media channels such as Facebook and Twitter or through some of our public opinion surveys. Now I should mention that the nature of our work limits our ability to discuss open files outside of formal proceedings, which will likely limit my ability to answer some of the questions that you may have for me today, but I promise you, I will do my best. It's also worth noting that the CRTC's activities are largely funded by the very industries we regulate, rather than through general tax revenue. I provide this context in order to clarify and acknowledge that while closing the digital divide is a priority for the federal government as a whole, I can only speak to the role that the CRTC is playing and the initiatives that are under our purview. I am not speaking on behalf of the federal government or the federal public service. Now with that said, in a few short decades, Canada has moved from wired voice only services to incredibly fast, fixed and mobile digital networks. The CRTC has introduced a series of measures to keep pace with these changes and to ensure that all Canadians have access to the advantages that they can deliver. Let's move on to slide number three. The CRTC has been defining what constitutes basic telecommunication services for decades. Now, by defining what constitutes basic services, the CRTC can then set objectives for universal access to those services, as well as establishing a fund to help deliver these services in underserved areas, such as rural areas and remote regions of the country at affordable rates. In 1999, the CRTC established a basic service objective, which included the minimum services and features companies offering residential local telephone services had to deliver. Now at one time, and I'm old enough to remember this, I'm sure a lot of you on here aren't, at one time these included a copy of the phone book, access to long distance calling, and dial up to internet, internet access. Now in the modern area, access to broadband internet and mobile wireless connectivity has become crucial a must have rather than a nice to have. We increasingly rely, rely on these technologies to communicate with one another, to educate and entertain ourselves, and to access an even broader range of services from banking to healthcare to household utilities. Our reliance on broadband internet and mobile technologies will only continue to grow. To better understand the telecommunications needs of Canadians and the impact of these changes, the CRTC has conducted consultations in the past decade. More than 50,000 people participated. They included individuals, business owners, representatives of governments at all levels, and of Indigenous communities. Many expressed concerns about the possibility of being left behind in the digital age, that they would not be fully able to realize the promise of new technologies. Now, in response, in December 2016, the CRTC announced that broadband internet access and mobile wireless services are now part of the new universal service objective and should be available to all Canadians, no matter where they live. Now, that can include a municipality of 10 or 10,000 people. It simply doesn't matter. Everyone should have access to broadband internet and mobile wireless services and be able to fully participate in the digital economy. Now to measure success, the CRTC set out the following criteria for fixed internet access service of speeds of at least 50 megabits per second download and 10 megabits per second upload speeds, as well as having an unlimited data option available. 
Now, just for your reference, you may hear others in the industry referring to 5010 when discussing minimum broadband speeds. The 50 megabits per second download and 10 megabits per second upload speeds are what they're referring to when they do so. To help ensure that broadband internet services, access services, sorry, in rural and remote areas are comparable to those available in urban centers, the objective also includes quality of service metrics. The objective also sets out the latest mobile wireless technology should be available not only in Canadian homes and businesses, but also on major roads throughout Canada. Let's move to uh, slide number four, please. Governments around the world, including Canada, are leveraging private and public sector resources in the face of fiscal realities and practical concerns, such as geography and sparse population in rural and remote areas. Now, a country the size of Canada, with its varying geography and climate, faces unique challenges in providing similar broadband internet access services for all Canadians. But we are making progress. The latest 2019 data shows that 45.6% of households in rural areas can access the 5010 speeds with unlimited data. Now that's an improvement over the 40.8% that could access those speeds back in 2018. We are meeting today in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. While many of us have been in the fortunate position to adapt to this unprecedented disruption, countless others are struggling to keep their businesses afloat their employees paid, and their families fed. Many Canadians in rural and remote areas do not have access to broadband internet infrastructure that delivers fixed broadband internet service access service of 50, 10 megabits per second download and upload speeds, and with options for unlimited data plans. Much work still needs to be done, but we are getting there. We expect that by the end of 2021, 90% of Canadian homes and businesses will be able to access the universal service objective level services. The remaining 10% will join them as soon as possible within the next decade. Now, as you can see from the infographic on this screen, there are many in Canada living in urban areas that have access to fixed broadband internet access service of 5010 megabits per second with unlimited data plan options but there is definitely work to be done in rural and remote areas of the country. We are fully aware of that. Now let's take a look at slide number five. For example, Canada has vast tracts of land with sparse population throughout the province, making it difficult to build a network that provides service to all. As you can see on the eligibility geographic map for our broadband fund, there are many areas in, in green, now these are regions in Alberta with population that do not have access to a 50, 10 megabits per second service. Rural communities supply products like lumber, concrete, steel, fuel, of course, and are the primary source of food, which are crucial to Alberta's and Canada's for that matter, economy. Alberta, Albertans who work and live in rural communities support and contribute to the prosperity of the province. It is vital to ensure that reliable internet connection is available for all Canadians, including those in rural and remote areas as well. Now the situation is similar for indigenous communities, which are often located in the most remote regions of the country and are often therefore the most difficult to serve. Funds such as the CRTC Broadband Fund are geared to provide fundings in these hardest to reach underserved areas in Canada. The figures are bleak on First Nations reserved, reserves, where just 34.8% of the population can access the universal service objective, compared with 31.3% in 2018. Moreover, in 2019, this kind of service was entirely unavailable to First Nations reserves in Newfoundland and Labrador, Yukon and Northwest Territories. Let's move to slide number six. But the CRTC Broadband Fund has approved four projects proposing to build broadband internet access infrastructure in the Yukon and Northwest Territories that propose to serve Indigenous communities. Now, once built, 
those numbers in the two territories will improve. I personally am looking forward to seeing those numbers go up. Each region of Canada is unique and has its very own needs and challenges as you can uh, appreciate. For example, in BC and Quebec, more than 90% of residents have access to fixed broadband internet access services that meet the universal service objective. While those living in some Atlantic provinces, Manitoba and Saskatchewan are in the 60% to 80% range. Here in Alberta, the percentage of households able to access the 5010 megabits per second speed target is close to 88%. But in our rural areas, our rural regions, only 33% have that kind of service and even fewer, less than 20%, have attained the universal service objective in First Nations reserves. When it comes to long-term evolution, you probably know it as LTE, LTE coverage by region. Well, the good news is that both urban centers and rural communities have nearly the same access to this technology. In Alberta, almost the entirety of the population is covered by LTE. 99.9% .9 of households in urban centers and 98.9% .9 in rural communities. The worst off and most in need are people living and working in the far north. In the three northern territories, no households have access to a broadband internet service that actually meets the CRTC's universal service objective. And only one third of major roads are covered by LTE mobile wireless service. All that to say that a connectivity gap persists. Now the CRTC recognizes that independent internet service providers, as well as other service providers, can offer solutions for bridging this gap, but no single entity can bridge the connectivity gap alone. It will take a collective effort from the private and public sectors together. Let's move on to slide seven. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the CRTC's broadband fund. I know you've heard of it. So back in 2019, the CRTC established the broadband fund that will distribute up to $750 million in the first five years. Now the fund aims to provide upgrades to existing infrastructure, as well as new construction to improve broadband internet access and mobile wireless services in rural and remote regions that lack an acceptable level of access. These regions are usually where the needs are the greatest, such as rural communities and indigenous communities. And as stated earlier, based on our data, Indigenous communities particularly face far greater challenges to obtaining connectivity than other parts of the country. Now, when awarding funding, the Commission gives special consideration to projects that make the most efficient use of the funding available. When deciding which projects to select, the CRTC considered, among other things, whether they would contribute to meeting the universal service objective and have a significant positive impact on Canadians. I should also add that Canadian corporations of all sizes, provincial, territorial, and municipal government organizations, as well as First, Count First Nations uh, councils or indigenous governments were all eligible to apply for funding from the broadband fund. Let's move to slide eight. In the summer of 2019, we issued a first call for applications targeting the Yukon, the Northwest Territories and Nunavut, as well as satellite dependent communities across Canada where the need is acutely felt in that no household in the territories has access to a broadband service that meets all the elements of our universal service objective. And only one third of major roads are covered by LTE mobile wireless service. Now, we received 15 applications in response to our first call seeking funding for various types of projects. And in August of 2020, we announced $72 million in funding for five projects that will improve internet access services to more than 10,000 households in 51 communities, the significant majority of which are indig Indigenous. In November 2019, we issued a second call for applications covering eligible geographic areas in all regions of the country, including those previously targeted in the first call. 
In that call, we received almost 600 applications seeking over $1.5 billion in funding, exceeding what we were able to give out. So in response to the second call for applications, we announced to date a total of up to $84.4 million in funding, nearly 2,000 kilometers of fiber networks will be built, covering up to 56 communities in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and Northern Quebec. Now, while this is good news, you can imagine the amount of applications left to analyze. We are continuing to evaluate the remaining applications as quickly as possible with due diligence. We will be making further funding announcements as we approve additional projects. And while I can't speak, as I said at the very beginning, to any specific application, I can tell you that there are some of the remaining applications that we are evaluating at this point that are proposing to serve underserved areas right here in Alberta. Let's move to slide number nine, please. To complement the broadband fund, in December of 2019, we launched a consultation to identify and address barriers that can make it challenging to build or extend transport networks to underserved areas. The industry identified timely and affordable access to telecom poles as one of the most significant barriers. I know there's been a lot of talk about that in Alberta. The CRTC then launched a new proceeding on October 30th to explore solutions to this issue. We are currently reviewing the interventions we have since received. And a public consultation was also launched in November with a view to better understand the state of telecom services in Northern Canada. We want to know if more needs to be done to ensure Canadians in the North have access to high quality services at reasonable rates. Now, as you may know, uh, and it worth, it's worth repeating, while the CRTC does not regulate retail internet rates, there is one notable exception to that rule. We do regulate the rates and services offered by Northwest Health, the incumbent carrier in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Northern British Columbia, and Northern Alberta. Given that there is a lack of competition in those areas, and that's the reason we do it. Now, initial comments for that proceeding were due by January 20th, 2021. Let's move on to slide number 10, please. While the CRTC is doing its part, Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada, also known as ICED, estimated that at least $8 billion will be required to close the broadband gap in Canada. If we want to achieve the universal service objective by the end of the decade, it is clear that both private and public sector invest in, as investments will be required. Now, in terms of other federal initiatives, in November of 2020, the Government of Canada announced its 1.75 billion universal broadband fund, which seeks to ensure that 98% of Canadians have access to broadband services at minimum speeds of 5010 by 2026 and 100% by 2030. Under its connectivity strategy, the government also launched an online portal bringing together all the sources of broadband funding offered by federal departments and agencies. Now there, you can learn more about other federal broadband funding programs like the Canadian Infrastructure Bank's $2 billion loan program for broadband infrastructure initiatives. Funding is also available through the initiatives of several provinces and territories as well. Meanwhile, although a broadband gap persists, private industry continues to extend the reach of their broadband networks. I believe that with all parties contributing as they are today, broadband connectivity for all Canadians is achievable over the next decade. All right, let's move to slide number 11. There is no doubt that meeting the universal service objective would benefit all Canadians, regardless of where they live. It would open the door to a wealth of economic, social and cultural opportunities, especially now. The pandemic has only reinforced just how critical reliable broadband internet is for all Canadians. There's also no doubt, however, that meeting this objective represents a major challenge, a challenge simply too onerous for any single organization to overcome. 
Our geography in Canada is simply too vast and our underserved communities are too dispersed. Now in the past, Canada has overcome similar infrastructure challenges through effective collaboration. Examples include the Transcontinental Railway, the Trans-Canada Highway, and our very first telecommunications networks. All were the result of collaboration between the public and the private sectors. Now, a similar approach is needed to close Canada's digital divide. Yes, the business case seems impossible in many remote areas, but the list of potential partners is long. Federal organizations and departments, the provinces and territories, municipalities, indigenous governments, telecommunications companies and non-governmental institutions. Ultimately, what we need is shared leadership and a united response. That's why events such as this conference here today are so incredibly important. By coming together, even virtually, as we are here today in the middle of a pandemic, we have an opportunity to share our knowledge, our ideas, and best practices in order to help bridge the di digital divide. And I would like to thank the organizers for affording me the opportunity to speak at this year's event. Thank you. Merci de m'avoir invité. Excellent. Well, Commissioner, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, you know, and, and I, I recognize too that you've had to onboard into this position while we're in the middle of a, a global pandemic. So uh, with that being said, it's, uh, it's I'm sure been a, a, a quite a taxing experience <laughs> to, to say the least. I, I haven't even had a chance to meet my other commissioners in person yet, if, if that makes any sense. And I've been in the role since July. So um, we're hoping that, you know, pretty soon that we'll be able to, to, we'll be able to travel again and we can do that. But I know everybody in this uh, forum right now is feeling the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'd be remiss if I, I didn't kind of touch on this. Um, the Rogers proposed acquisition of Shaw is top of mind of a lot of people here today. And I know um, it'll be entering hearing, so it may be difficult to comment on. But could you please update everyone on how the C CRTC uh, review will be conducted? Yeah. So the portion of the transaction involving the uh, telecommunication services is subject to the Telecommunications Act and does not actually require the CRTC's prior approval. So a lot of people don't know that. Uh, the CRTC, though, will be reviewing the portion of the transaction subject to the Broadcasting Act. Now, an application for that portion has, uh, has to be um, submitted and filed with the CRTC. And once a complete application is received, a notice of consultation will be published on the CRTC website. Um, and please note that this transaction will also require many other approvals as well. For example, not the least of which I'm sure you can imagine would be from the Competition Bureau. But when it, do it does come to the CRTC and we do post it on our website with for our notice of consultation, that's where people like you, organizations that, that have you know, the public's best interest in mind can actually go and be interveners and make comments there on our website. So feel free to do that. It's, it's a, a very open process. We, we just strive to be as transparent as we can and we look forward to comments on, on pretty much everything that comes before us. Excellent. So that, that kind of ties in. So you, um, there, there's a lot of options for individuals to become interveners there. Um, if, if you're kind of not necessarily wanting to become an intervener into the, the process, what would be the best way to kind of engage the CRTC, either now or as the hearing begins? Uh, you know what, there are, uh, just go to the site, read the inter what other interveners are having to say about it, um, see if, if you can reach out to them to, to, so that they can act as a voice for you, or, or you're welcome to send letters as well. Um, you can send them directly to the CRTC. Our website is incredible and will guide you through some of that, but we're happy to hear from the public. Excellent. Um, you know, you, you're six months into the role so far, if I'm doing my math correctly. Um, and, uh, and, and can you tell me a little bit more about the, the role you're taking on and, and what your key focuses are as, as you move forward? Yeah. So like you said, Graham, I came from a journalism background. Um, and so communication's always been really important to me. Um, and I, I know that, that it can, if it's not done right, if it's not open and, um, state of the art, um, 
the public suffers. So it's been important. It was always my dream when I left journalism. I always thought I'm gonna, I wanna go work at the CRTC someday. So I, you know, this is a dream come true for me. But basically my role as a CRTC commissioner is to ensure that Canadians have access to fair and equitable communications. Um, which include television, radio, and telecommunications. We supervise broadcasting and telecommunications in the public's interest. Basically, we are representing the public. Um, we're a quasi-judicial organization uh, that's arm's length from the government, as I mentioned earlier. And the commissioners have a, a, a chance to take part in the decision-making process. So, um, you know, we, we sit together with different files that come before us, read the various uh, interventions and documentation and and talk about, you know, what's in the public's best interest and um, and make decisions on that. Excellent. Um, you know, in the in the past six months, what are some of the or what is some of the feedback that you've been receiving from people um, just in relation to the role the CRTC takes or any or any public comment that may be occurring, especially in light of the uh, pandemic occurring, too? Um, you know, I think people are, are, are thrilled that, that we, you know, it took a pandemic for us to realize just how important connectivity is, right? I mean, these things we sometimes take for granted. And then a pandemic comes and you, and it, like I said before, it's not a nice to have, it is crucial. I mean, during this pandemic, we've been hearing from people who've said, you know, thank God the pandemic came in, in the 21st century. I mean, we couldn't have worked from home, um, schooled our children from home, done medical appointments from home and had entertainment from home had it not been in this, you know, in the, this year, in the, you know, in this century. So I think people have sort of um, felt that, that we've been very lucky to be as, you know, connected as we are right now. But saying that, I mean, I have heard from uh, some Albertans about some of the challenges in Alberta, I know that in rural Alberta, it's been difficult um, with the, the, just the, the quality of, of connections and the number of people in any one household that are having to rely on those connections at any given time. So we're very cognizant of that. And we also know that um, uh, you know, having access to really good uh, cell phone service, especially in remote communities for farmers and so on is extremely important. And in this day and age, um, we're using connectivity in ways we never thought before. I mean, farmers are using connectivity to diagnose um, diseases in crops, right? In their fields, like through Wi-Fi. Um, in parts of the world, they're, they're using connectivity and broadband for telling people that it's time to get their next vaccination, even aside from the pandemic. I mean, there's just so much going on. And uh, I think we're just uh, at, we're at the beginning of it and we're gonna see where this takes us post pandemic. So you, you spoke of the uh, the broadband fund and, and some of the impacted communities. Um, just almost in an anecdotal way, could you tell me um, some of the overall impacts that you've heard about in regards to the fund as it's been rolled out? Well, you know, it's really hard for, uh, all I can say is that who we've given the money to um, and that it's so early in the process that we can't even really assess it. So what 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 we've done is we've announced three groups of people that are getting money. And what they have to do is then uh, come back and report to us every three months to tell us how, you know, how it's going, how far they are, and how that compares to their initial application so that we know that they're on target and whether things are changing. Um, but it's too early to say exactly much more about those projects, but I can tell you that we've handed out um, um, like 72.1 million to five projects in Manitoba, Yukon, two in the Northwest Territories. There was a second uh, call for transport connectivity, uh, which went uh, $27 million went to BC, Saskatchewan and Ontario. And then you probably heard just the other day on March 19th that we announced um, seven more transport projects, which is basically laying the groundwork for uh, connectivity. And they're receiving $57.7 million and that's going to be for about 1,400 kilometers of fiber transport in um, northern Quebec, Ontario, and BC. Excellent. And, and just like kind I of said, a sorry, Graham, we still have 600 more applications to go through. And we know that uh, in those, uh, I've specifically asked because I'm the commissioner for Alberta, you know, are there good quality ones for Alberta? And all I can tell you is that they're saying yes. So, excellent. Yeah. And I know. Uh, it the uh, the minister of service Alberta spoke about some of those as uh, as the 
time moved on or in earlier yesterday. Uh, just kind of final uh, question to close us. Are there any future initiatives from the CRTC that people should be more aware of um, or should really pay close attention to? Yeah, so um, future funding announcements are gonna be uh, made and forthcoming. Um, you don't have to just rely on us though. I mean, uh, another ongoing broadband proceeding relates to uh, Northwest Tel, the incumbent uh, carrier that I mentioned earlier uh, that handles Yukon, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Northern BC and Northern Alberta. Um, so given the extent to which the pandemic has highlighted the vital role played by broad broadband connectivity across the country and in rural and remote communities, our consultation is looking at the state of telecom services in northern Canada and the steps that can be taken to ensure Canadians in the north actually have uh, access to high quality services at reasonable rates. Uh, and so initial comments on that Northwest Tel uh, application are due January 20th in uh, 2021, and I can't comment much further, but I do direct people also to um, the fact that there are lots of other places that you can find funding. I mean, um, I'm just uh, gonna, sorry, just take a quick look at my notes. I, I urge you to go and look at ISED's Universal Broadband Fund projects. There's a lot of really interesting stuff coming out of there. Uh, if you want me to send you the link after this meeting so that you can share it with everyone, I'm happy to do that. But there are other projects, not just with the CRTC that are coming out. And I can try to share some of those links with you, Graham, if you want to share them out. Absolutely. I know we have a lot of information we're going to share with, um, you know, the plus 200 registrants who joined us here. And we'd be happy to, to share any information that you'd like for us to share um, that you find would be really relevant for the audience here. So Happy commissioner, so. yeah, commissioner, thank you so much for, for joining us. And, and I, I know all of us are really looking forward to the ongoing work that we're going to be doing uh, with you as uh, you carry out your, your new role here. Well, thank you for letting me be part of this important discussion. I hope I get to meet all of you in person uh, at the next forum or one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I really look forward to it. And um, please keep doing the good things that you're doing, Graham. I appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Nirmala Naidu is the commissioner of the CRTC for Alberta and the Northwest Territories. Up next, uh, we're going to introduce uh, Paul McLaughlin, who is a professional biologist and has an environmental scientist or has been an environmental scientist consultant uh, for over 26 years, but he is also a fourth term Pinoca County Councillor and is the current Reeve of Pinoca County on top of a very important role that he uh, maintains as the president of the rural municipalities of Alberta. Uh, Reeve, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us here today. Great, well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm pretty excited to be here. And, and I'm the proud president of the rural municipalities of Alberta. And I'm proud of this conversation today uh, I will admit I'm a bit of a geek, so I kind of get excited about this, so I'm going to apologize right out of the gates that I'm going to get really fired up because this is a, a big discussion for us. And this is one of our, quite honestly, one of our top five conversations we have is broadband and connectivity. So this is critically important. I'm going to give you, I've got 30 minutes, I'm going to rock through some slides. Uh, we're going to show you some great data, but one of the biggest things that I want to share with you is, is my own broadband journey. Uh, my wife and I run our businesses on our farm. The only reason why we could be on our farm is that we actually had to actually self-supply broadband way back when. So we actually bought the, uh, we used satellite internet way back uh, 18 years ago. So this bad boy, I strapped to the side of my house and it actually emitted enough energy that you could actually roast a chicken on this thing. Um, so imagine the technology 18 years ago. Now, I haven't actually tried to roast a chicken on it, but just to give you some, some thoughts that this is how the technology is flowed. The reason why I live where I am and I've actually uh, embraced the, the rural livelihood is because of broadband. And I'm not alone. And I see that in a lot of places. Uh, you're able to actually start to do what you wanted to do in the city. And my wife and I have been able to make this shift to rural Alberta 18 years ago. Um, and the one thing about broadband, you folks all know this, once you install it, you better start talking about the next technology because by the time you strapped it to the side of your house, uh, I think it's critically important. So I'm gonna just bring up my slides here, make sure you folks can see them. You folks can see my slide, does someone wave or nod or? We're all good. Perfect, good, good. And I did quite well. I actually didn't uh, mute myself and say, am I muted and start talking um, as well. So, uh, but I do wanna talk a little bit about what our organization is. Uh, give you an idea of who we are. Uh, RMA was formed in 1909, and we're really an advocacy organization. We provide insurance, and, and we actually provide bulk procurement services for our members. 
Um, but along with the advocacy, we actually represent those 69 rural municipalities. And we are truly an advocate. We're member driven. Uh, we make decisions based upon uh, what our members want. And that's actually how we drive forward. So we include all the municipal districts, um, the counties. We have five specialized municipalities and special areas. And, and towns and villages are part of the rural landscape. And we have strong relationships with the towns and villages as well. When we say rural, we truly mean all the pieces of rural. Uh, and I think it's critical to know that's actually how we see the world. Um, and so we actually undertake a tremendous amount of advocacy. So we deal with uh, transmission issues, uh, planning and development, environmental concerns, agriculture. And I'm really for this group, you can tell broadband. And as I said, this is one of our key focus areas. Re reliable rural broadband is connected to every rural service that we're providing. I think you folks have probably heard that over the last couple of days. Everything from public safety to municipal inf infrastructure is enhanced by this connectivity. So this is just critically important to how we do things. Um, we deal with a lot of issues. And so we just actually, I wanna talk a little bit about how our advocacy is guided. Um, we rely on member resolutions to guide our advocacy. Um, and just as an example, we just finished our conference uh, virtually, which is, you can just imagine, you folks have all been down that road. Uh, we had a um, resolutions tied to AER transfer, police act, um, medical cannabis production, agricultural services board funding, preservation of source water, flood insurance. Um, we deal with so many issues that really it's partnering. And I think that was one of the messages uh, that the commissioner made is partnering is a critical part of this conversation. So we're very, very happy to actually partner with uh, Siberia on these type of things because that technical expertise and those boots on the ground is critically important. And really what we do find is that we have to keep on top of things. This government moves tremendously fast. And so we've actually had to really keep on our toes. We've dealt with 911 levy, uh, recall legislation, all these other pieces. But really we have this important role uh, as a board to actually communicate to our members on behalf of our members too as well. We have been advocating too as well. So we've actually been involved with the provincial broadband strategy. Uh, we've, we've been involved with provincial funding streams. Uh, we have really been, been engaged actually at the CRTC and ICED consultation level. So we provided comment um, and we regularly participate in these and actually quite currently we've been participating in these. Uh, we've also been advocating for rural bad band funding as, and we've been involved with the uh, UBF that you've already talked about too as well. Um, and really it requires municipalities to partner with an internet service provider. So again, partnering is a critical piece to how we're delivering these services. And you, you can build the infrastructure and be involved in the in infrastructure. And I will talk about some of the, the municipal investments that we made across the board. Uh, my municipality actually uh, installed nine towers all across the county and actually opened up those towers to internet service providers, ISPs to connect to that. We have about 95% coverage in my county. And one of the interesting conversations is, is that there's been nothing that I've ever done as a rural elected leader that had no criticism. Um, our investment in rural infrastructure to provide uh, internet service to our members had no criticism. And trust me, on a daily basis, I'm reminded of all the things I do that actually warrant some, some level of criticism. So we are seeing investments right now. Red Deer County is part of a $20 million program. Clearwater County is involved with, with programs. Lethbridge County. So these investments are happening at the municipal level based upon these partnerships as well. I think you folks all know rural broadband. The only reason why I can talk to you today is that my two little broadband leeches are at school today. Um, so I'm able to actually have that bandwidth available to me. My kids have been learning from home and all you folks have experienced this. But it's this work from home, economic development, modern agriculture, precision agriculture. I'm on the board of directors for Olds College. And really this, this, this synergization of technology and agriculture is really what's gonna help feed the world in the future. And I think that ultimately telehealth, those conversations, access to all the pieces that increase the quality of life of rural, rural Albertans is critically important too as well. And I think that the government of Alberta is expressing interest in this telehealth service. And I'm very excited by this because we are having difficulty having the service in rural Alberta. So telehealth, remote, using nodes to, to increase the health care and increase the health of rural Albertans. Uh, surveys have shown that rural Albertans actually have a shorter life expectancy, those that live in the urban centers. And that is access to actual care and telehealth would be a, a tremendous way to bridge that. But I think the other piece is quality of life. You know, I've talked to a lot of rural uh, farmers in my area that have actually changed how they farmed by actually things they've learned on the internet. So we're improving our agriculture, we're improving our quality of life, and we've actually been able to actually move through this process by sharing this information. And it's not done yet. 
We need to actually bridge that gap. And we've talked a lot about the divide. So what we've done actually as part of our advocacy is we've actually started to take some speed testing. So I'm going to show you some, some raw data here. And I'm pretty excited about this because I, this is really about facts and not about other pieces or, or other, other uh, bits of information. And so we've actually partnered with uh, CRI or CIRA uh, to run test speeds all throughout Alberta. And we're using this, this information to actually demonstrate what it's like on the ground. So this isn't the advertised speeds. Uh, this isn't uh, two o'clock on a Sunday. This is really starting to sample. And so we've actually been using reported individual tests and we're gonna go through the province here and tell a bit of this story. And these statistics are really important to actually be able to report to the folks providing the service. And so basically, as we've begun our speed testing in the fall of 2020, so you, you folks get to see again the geeky stuff, you get to see the, the, the wonderful data that we've supplied. Uh, and just to, just to let you know too as well as I am just a figurehead. Uh, I have a tremendous amount of, 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 of strength uh, behind me. So Warren Naga put this together and, and he's actually done a phenomenal job. So I'm gonna make it sound like I created this and I by no means created this. Um, but really actually, and this is just rural, so just be noted that this isn't actually pulling in any of the villages and towns data. Uh, so we've got data back to 2015. On the first column, we see the number of tests that have occurred, and you can tell that we've really ramped it up. Uh, in 2020, we've had sampling that was greater than all the years prior. Uh, it's likely that people are at home. Uh, I, we've actually picked up a few municipalities that they may have made this some sort of game that they've sampled a tremendous amount. Like there's actually one county that looks like they do it every three or four times a day. We're not too sure if they're making it sort of like a, a drinking game or some sort of contest. Um, and now the next two columns show the download speed. And this is that digital divide. This is that conversation that we're having. And you can see that there's a ramping up, but you can see that it's really not ne anywhere near the average figures that we're talking about. And obviously the jitter and latency, all the other geeks in the room here really understand what that means, but it's really not only speed, not only download, not only upload, but it's actually the quality of that connection is a, is a critical importance. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the municipalities. So these are all the folks that we represent in the district down in the beautiful South. Um, and so this is sort of the raw averaging data. Remember, this is a snapshot in time. This data is moving forward. Uh, we're trying to ensure that we're getting the best quality data possible. But you can see, again, if you actually start looking at the, the median data, uh, 10 and less than two is what you're going to see. Now, any of you folks know that if you're watching someone freeze on Zoom, that upload speed really starts to become actually the, the weak link in the armor. That's where the piece that actually has, has the biggest issue. So this is our raw data. Now, the one thing that I need to draw your attention to is outliers. There's there's outlier data there that might be noisy data, but I, th I think if you just look at all these municipal partners of the, if they've done this testing, you can see that really um, they're sort of averaging in that, that 10 area, which our initial data showed as well. So, um, and because of we had low testing numbers in some situations, we're showing some skewing, but so the whole goal here is to provide you sort of that snapshot, that trend, where we're going, where we're at today, and knowing that there are a few that are, as you get closer to certain centers, um, I'm, I'm suggesting that you, you wouldn't probably use this data, I think maybe to buy a, a, a recreational property in some of these areas or looking at your farm, some of this data might have some skewed as well. Um, the one thing I will note too as well is uh, there has been a huge shift of people wanting to live in rural Alberta. And the number one question they ask isn't how amazing the REEB is. They don't actually ask what the tax is. They actually don't ask about the services. The number one question we are getting is rural bandwidth and what speeds are existing or available to folks that are moving into rural Alberta. And I think that's a telling, telling point uh, as we move through as well. So this is the other piece of data. So this is median upload speeds. Again, beware of the outliers. Um, I love the MD of Willow Creek. I'm pretty sure they're not getting 160 upload speed. Uh, I, I'd love it if they did. This is back in 2018. Um, I would expect this is a bit of a noisy artifact, the data. But again, looking again, this is that upload speed. This is actually whether or not folks are able to actually move video up and down, moving files up and down, a critical piece of the quality of bandwidth. So these are all the samples were taken. Uh, so again, we're actually collecting this data on behalf of CRA. So critically important, this is starting to put together that boots on the ground story that we're trying to tell. Again, I'm just going to move you through the, the counties too as well. This is District 2, beautiful central Alberta. Uh, this is the, the part of the world that I'm living in right now. Again, speaking to you uh, from my cow pasture in central Alberta. 
And again, the data is fairly similar, a little slower in some cases. Um, we had 2,700 tests. So thankful to the people of Central Alberta, they've, they started to do these tests and we're starting to build this up and we're spending the next year collecting this data and increasing it. Um, again, median down is 7.32, uh, median up is 1.6. Again, way below the standard that's being spoken about. Uh, this is sort of the, the clustering where the data occurs. Uh, where the sampling has been occurring. So this is sort of where, where we're actually collecting the data. Um, same with Pemina River too as well. So this is the Pemina River District 3, sort of north Edmonton area, around that area. Um, so again, 7.82, uh, far below the standard uh, that's out there. And again, you're, this is a median data, uh, but you're getting the max uploads of, of, of or downloads of 17.3, max downloads of 2.6. So this digital urban divide, our data is showing that there's a tremendous uh, lack of quality service. Uh, these are sort of the clustering of, of where the data sets were found too as well, where we've collected the information as well. And I think that you can see that really a single test can skew these median values. So it's really these outliers. So we're, we're going to have to massage the data. That's just a fundamental reality. But I think once we get our volume of data up, as we are seeing that, we're seeing tremendous number of tests. Um, that's been fantastic too as well. As we new, move through the northern part of the province, and I guess one note about RMA is we are the only uh, municipal association that covers 85% of the province, border to border to border. So we actually cover more land base than any other uh, municipal association in Canada too as well. And so um, as we move up to the north part of the, of, of the province, um, you're looking at data speeds that I think, you know, 6.39, 1.65 that you can see there's some strains. And I think that the commissioner have talked about the unserved, uh, talking about indigenous communities, but some of these unserved communities as well. I think it's it's really telling you that story that that uh, at the bottom end of that, we're starting to see lack of data. And you can see this is sort of the clustering of where our samplings occurred. Obviously you're going up to the Wood Buffalo area too as well. Edmonton East, so there's actually a pocket, one of our districts you represent, uh, beautiful Lac La Biche County, moving over into Provost up to the border there. Uh, so these good people have been sampling quite a bit too as well. Uh, and I think that, uh, um, you know, 11.27, 11 11 2.38. So you are seeing that the, the Lloyd Minster, some of the urban centers are driving up their data as well. Um, and, and their sample size isn't too large. Um, you could also see that uh, somebody's got a rock and max download speed of 122. Uh, I don't know what kind of gaming they're doing up there, but pretty impressive. Um, but I would expect that that might be a little above artifact. Um, and so I think speaking of this data too, I think that the rural municipalities are closer to a larger urban center, obviously are having the higher speed. So they're changing our data a little bit. But again, if we actually look at this project from a volume standpoint, really our story is being told. And that is, is that, that we are a far, far cry from, from what's really that, uh, that projected universal speed as well. Um, and, and this speed testing is a complex conversation. Uh, the reality is, is that it has to be completed over time. I need to look at true speeds. Uh, you know, you got a long weekend and my kids are on the internet. My speeds aren't great on a long weekend when my kids are home. Um, and I think that really we're looking at more testing. The one statement I could say is that regardless of the volume, we are seeing this trend. Approximately 90% of the tests are not, are failing to meet that 50-10. And, and I think when we say it's important, I actually would actually change the word. I do not believe broadband speed is important. I think it's critical to rural Alberta. I think it's actually starts to get to this conversation. And it is my belief that I'm not speaking on behalf of RMA, but I actually think this should be a charter, charter right. I actually think that we should have this as a charter right access to these speeds is, is I think something that should be a right to every single Canadian. That's my true belief. And as you can see, when you have 90% of the tests, rural Alberta is definitely far, far behind as well. So we are gonna to continue to collect this data. Um, and, and as I said, we're trying to play uh, districts off of each other. Some of them have turned this into a game, but we're really trying to collect as much data as possible uh, because I think we need to actually ensure that we have that narrative and that narrative that's data-driven, that we can tell our story. Uh, we need to be well-served as other jurisdictions. Uh, this, this divide is huge and we need to increase our advocacy, both federal and provincial based on this real-time data. So, and really we couldn't do this without the partnerships, the partnerships from our members, the partnerships from the service providers and us moving forward on this piece. Because as soon as I said, as soon as you build a system, you better start talking about replacing the system with the next technology that's coming. Um, this is really a moving, moving per process. We need to get ahead. We are so far behind, um, but I think we can do this together. And I think the one final point that I would make too as well is, is I think that when you look at this conversation, everything that I talk about 
as the, as the president of rural municipalities of Alberta, is one degree away from rural connectivity. It's really this gap between things, this lack of information, this lack of, lack of access. And the fact is we need to increase this. We need to actually take this together and we need to do this together because the only way you can successfully take this on is through partnerships. And sadly enough, when you start looking at some of these data, you actually compare some of this data from an international perspective, we are sorely far, far behind as rural Albertans. I had actually just finished riding a horse, horse in the, in the uh, jungles of Zimbabwe and uh, I was able to actually get a very, very good Wi-Fi connection to call an Uber to pick me up after I just saw a herd of elephants in rural Zimbabwe. So you can imagine that other, other countries have really committed to this and it's become critically important to rural areas and other places in the world. And I think Canadians need to take this on too as well. So I'm a fierce advocate, very excited. And I'm really, I think we're at a time, I think I got a few minutes, I can take some questions too. So thank you very much. And we will share our slides too, our data too as well. So. We'll definitely provide those to any folks that want them. Excellent, Paul. Thank you so much. And, and I, I can really appreciate the uh, enthusiasm that comes from the RMA on this issue. Um, my guess, and, and feel free to supplement this, that a lot of this is really driven, it has some of it started to drive because of the COVID-19 pandemic and sort of the, the insufficiencies that have been exposed from that. Oh, I, I agree. I think that uh, um, th the fact is we've had people that have had to, to drive to another node to get access. Um, I, I've been on more than one Zoom meeting that someone's in a parking lot of a Tim Hortons. I mean, they've had to drive to town. So you, you're right. I think we've always had this problem. Um, at the same time, I think that that we can take a positive spin on this is the fact that we realize that we can actually accelerate and grow our economy if we have this broadband connectivity. Um, if there's one thing that we've learned through this whole process is one of the most critical parts of our society on the back end of COVID has been agriculture. And agriculture is starting to use connectivity as a way to drive efficiency and better use of resources, better quality product, and actually starting to drive the economy. So, so I think it's this one of these disruptions you're in the middle of that you're hard to realize actually it's parts of it are good and parts of it are bad. But I think that uh, I think it's exciting. I think we can actually really start to change our society for the better. And, and, and if we have a little bit of lag right now, Let's let's make this something critically important as well. Uh, so, Paul, Helen had a question. Did the RMA collect data on connection types to correlate to the speed of slash QoS data? Um, that's very important. She kind of knows that that's a very important and helps to interpret the outliers. I know we kind of get a bit technical on that that question. I'm not sure if you're able to yeah, sort no, of speak it, to the data. So, so the way the data is collected. So when we say we collect the data, we're actually directing our folks to actually connect through a portal, through the CRA portal. So that's actually, that data will show up um, as they're, they're exposing those, those touch points too as well. So, but some of the stuff that you're talking about, you, you wouldn't know. And I think that you're right, talking about sort of what that type of service is, um, maybe that's the other deep dive too as well. Um, I, think, I think really when you look at the future, um, fiber's part of it, satellite's part of it, but we need to look at every piece of it. This has got multiple moving parts that we need to start picking little pieces of it and making sure that we're, we're connecting what's best to serve in certain areas. I, I, I'll, and I, one point is I'm actually gonna bankroll my own fiber line to a tower um, just because no one else is gonna do it. And I just wanna say that I did it because it sounds really cool. And so um, I'm doing that though, to see if I can hold that speed above what is actually, uh, what is actually that sort of lower level of what's, uh, what's the standard is. So, and I truth be told is I wanna be faster than my friends in the city. I'll be honest, I'm competitive. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm enjoying the fact that you're gamifying this, uh, this data that's been collected. Um, can you speak a little bit to the inspiration around collecting of this data? Like, have you been running into, like, or one of our first sort of speakers earlier in the day was talking about how um, sometimes the, the stats that the regulators are pulling may not necessarily correlate to what's actually happening on the ground or what people are experiencing. Um, was that some of the impact or were there certain things that inspired the, this process? Well, and, 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 and no, no offense to the commissioner at all. I don't mean, but what she said is different than what I just showed you. <laughs> so, so I'm showing you data, boots on the ground data that is quite different than what the, the federal government is saying. That's really bridging that gap. And, and this, isn't, this isn't driven by, by, by polarizing the conversation. Let's just go by real data on the ground, rural Alberta. I'm in the middle of my cow pasture. Um, can, my, can my kid do his schoolwork from the middle of, his cow, of my cow pasture? Yes or no? That's the conversation at the end of the day. And, and are we getting anywhere close to the 50-10? We're not. Excellent. Um, has RMA been in conversations with any partners about trying to 
find these solutions? Um, or, or is it kind of one of those things where you're trying not to sort of lock yourself into a corner? Um, or is, or, or are you still trying to determine the details or are you leaving it to kind of municipalities to, to figure out the response to? Um, I know it's kind of a loaded question in many parts, but like, no, um, you, you've, you've got, I looked at your, uh, your list here and there's some, there's some movers and shakers here in municipalities that have made this a high priority. So these folks are looking for local, local solutions for local decisions. Uh, we can herd the cats, but I'll, I gotta be honest with you. We're all Alberta leaders right across the board. They see this as critically important to their communities. They're driving the technology that best suits what they're doing. Um, and they're starting to partner up and start to find solutions that best suits their community. So, so we are the we are the collators, but uh, we're not necessarily the problem solvers. But we definitely do a job to actually connect uh, our partners and 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 with one another and and moving it that way. And you know, anytime government government's awesome, and I don't want to badmouth government because I am a politician. But uh, the market the market will sometimes needs help, but the market makes the best solutions on behalf of the people. So if we can find ways to bridge the market to the people, uh, and that's why Pinocchio County built the Towers. They built the towers because no one else was going to build towers. But Pinoca County ISP was not going to happen um, because I have enough trouble getting enough gravel on people's road, let alone bandwidth when the internet goes down. And as a father of two children, when the internet goes down, for some reason, it's always my fault. Like <laughs> always my fault. And I don't know why I tried to explain them how it works, but I still have to bear the brunt of that. Yeah, I guess it's uh, the generational shift. It's always been something that they've had experience. So it's clearly, yeah, your, your fault. Um, you know, to kind of close off, you know, we have the, the provincial broadband strategy is forthcoming. Um, you know, if, if you could um, sort of, ha if you had a magic wand and you could pick one thing that you would like to see out of the provincial broadband strategy, uh, what would that be? You know, I think that uh, I'll take the field of dreams approach to it. Um, I think that, uh, that, that SuperNet was un underutilized. I think we should have built some broadband bases. I think we need to black fiber every single tower that goes on in this province. Uh, every telecom and every power service provider should be black fibering. Uh, we should look at large trunk lines that are running core fiber through the province and allowing municipalities to connect to it. That's the solution. If you build a highway, you'll grow business. If you build an information highway, people will actually tap into it. So I think if we look at it from that approach, um, I, I think that we need to actually play it that way. And, and I think that if we spend too much energy trying to deal with the underserved, uh, we have issues dealing with the serve. So we need to look at all the technology. And I think you're having a dis you've had a discussion around um, satellite as well. Satellite isn't the solution for everybody. So it's that blended technology. So I think that if we can actually look at it from that approach, open up the technology, deal with local solutions. I think that's the best use of resources as well. Uh, and as I said, you know, I'm running fiber just to see I can. Um, but the fact is, is that that fiber isn't always a solution. Satellite isn't always a solution. So you need to look at all the different pieces to the puzzle too as well. Um, but I think that time is of the essence. It's one of those things, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago and today. And, and we just have to move. We are losing so much ground. This needs to be a critical priority for, for this government and all government levels. We need to just get this done because we're losing ground internationally as well as locally. Excellent. Reeve McLaughlin, thank you so much for joining us here. I, I really appreciate this. And uh, it was very informative to see kind of what's going on and sort of a grander provincial wide um, uh, perspective. So thank you so much. No, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Um, so we've talked federally, we've talked municipally, now we're going to transition uh, provincially. Uh, so Tom Mansfield, who is the Executive Director of Industry and Regional Relations Branch of Alberta Jobs, Economy and Innovation. Um, Tom will be uh, discussing the importance of innovation and, and technology and, and the role it plays in Alberta's landscape. Uh, Tom has a professional background in uh, including uh, that relates within senior economic development roles, as well as industrial uh, distribution, sales, and management in the private sector. Uh, John graduated of, out of uh, the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology and Operations Management. He holds an MBA from the University of Alberta School of Business. Tom, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks uh, for having me. Can you just let me know that you can hear me okay? can hear you perfectly. Okay, good. Thanks for that. Um, Interesting uh, way to make a presentation. I've been in lots of Zoom and various platform meetings uh, to date, um, but not one with maybe so large a, a participation and yet can't see a single person. So I'm um, going to look at myself and look at my, uh, my presentation and, and uh, notes here and, um, and uh, try to imagine you all sitting before me. Um, and, and, and hopefully there'll be a bit of time at the end for some, some engagement, some Q&A. 
So I, I believe that uh, when I give the word um, that someone will be able to advance the slides. I don't need to advance it just yet, but uh, um, I will uh, indicate when I'm ready to, to advance. So um, I'll uh, with that uh, get started. And so thanks uh, again for, for having us uh, here uh, this afternoon. Um, we wanna thank specifically Cybera and the Alberta Rural Connectivity Coalition um, to take part in this. Um, I think the fact that we are all doing this online um, is, is certainly, the, I guess, the irony or the, or the um, significance of that isn't, isn't lost on anyone given uh, um, what, we're, uh, what we're talking about uh, today and uh, yesterday and today. Um, I want to um, just extend appreciation for the opportunity to, um, to speak on behalf of, of Jobs Economy and Innovation. That's the ministry in the Alberta government that I'm a part of. Um, and talk a little bit about the, uh, the importance that we place on technology and innovation. Um, speak a little bit about uh, initiatives to accelerate growth in that area, um, whether it be uh, research and development, commercialization, or, or application of uh, technology uh, in, in the province. So it's gonna be a bit of a, probably a change of direction from the, at least the, the most uh, previous speaker. Um, and, um, We'll be looking to highlight uh, some of the some of the outcomes of uh, of the work uh, over the last few years, as well as um, some of the progress uh, that's been made in this space and, and where we uh, where we're aiming uh, going forward. So, from software to, to hardware, um, we know the digital transformation and and ICT is becoming a driver of new solutions and technology investments in the province. Um, it's not only enhancing the technology sector as its own entity, if you will, um, but it's offering competitive advantages to traditional sectors as they uh, adopt these technologies. Hearing some background noise, maybe I'll just pause for a moment. Okay, it seems to have resolved. Um, so um, supported by an enhanced technology and innovation ecosystem, Growth of the technology sector is driving the transformative change needed to position Alberta for the future. And it's really, this transition is underway. This isn't something that's gonna start soon. This is something that's already underway. Could we move to the next slide? Thank you. This past year has presented economic challenges that none, none of us anticipated. Our economy was starting to show some signs of recovery in life when uh, global oil prices crashed. And then of course, COVID-19 hit over a year ago. Businesses, industries, and communities across Alberta have had to deal with challenges never before experienced. And individuals, I should, I should add to that list. I mean, individuals within communities, we've all had to deal with something or multiple things as a result of, of these converging issues. However, the challenges and the hardship, given the present limitations that we're discussing here today, we have also witnessed innovation in the use of technology in rural Alberta. Businesses and municipalities have demonstrated a capacity to adapt and to continue to adapt. The rapid response to produce PPE, the move to online shopping and online learning are examples of this. Albertans are and will continue to be at the forefront of driving innovation on the ground and in the private sector. It's this entrepreneurial spirit that is further evidenced in the strong role that innovation and technology consistently play in our economy. And just a, a bit of uh, a few numbers to evidence that uh, the, the province's technology sector, um, as of the, the most recent numbers that are available, which are unfortunately back to 2017, it accounted for 8 point, an $8.9 billion contribution to our province's GDP, which was about 3% at the time. Um, we, we know that GDP, the contribution to GDP in this sector grew at about 20% from 2010 to 2017. And so we can, we can extrapolate that if that trend continues, which I think we'd all agree it's happening, uh, that impact on our economy is only gonna be uh, far greater as, as statistics become available to, to confirm that evidence. Um, in 2019, we have a little bit more recent numbers with uh, employment. Uh, there were just over 44,000 jobs, uh, technology jobs, accounting for just under 2% of provincial jobs in the province. Um, Again, looking at a trend from 2010 to 2019, the number of jobs in the sector grew by 21% uh, compared to all other sectors averaged a growth of 14%. So again, this sector really is growing and, um, and, and growing at a pace faster 
than other sectors in the economy. A vibrant technology and innovation ecosystem is really vital to diversing our economy. As we know, and as you've been speaking about, um, not a single industry, whether it be traditional or emerging, is unaffected by technology and by innovation. And so while several programs and innovations, or sorry, initiatives were already underway, the pandemic and our response to it within the government has accelerated this process. Could we go to the next slide? So I wanna highlight a few of our ministry's investments in research and innovation activities, primarily through partnerships and programs. This slide lists a sampling of, of those. There's certainly many more than that. I'm, I'm gonna key in on a few of these. The um, support for Alberta Innovates is something that's been going on for, for many, many years. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll also talk a little bit about the research capacity program and highlight the major innovation fund as well as uh, AMI or the Alberta Machine, uh, sorry, Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. Um, the Innovation Capital Working Group uh, uh, provided a report to government um, late last year and, uh, and is, is informing work that we're doing on some strategy development, which I'll also speak to in a minute. So starting with Alberta Innovates, um, with funding support from the government, it provides a number of programs that help Alberta's, Alberta's entrepreneurs and knowledge-based companies bring their ideas to reality. One of, these, one of the programs that I wanna highlight is the Regional Innovation Network, which I'm sure many, many of you are familiar with, which is an entrepreneur-focused community-based networks, or I should say there are multiple networks um, spread around the province with the goal of providing programs and services to accelerate the growth of technology and its adoption, as well as those companies that are tech-focused in their growth. Um, moving on to the research capacity program, since 2001, our ministry has invested more than $357 million in Alberta post-secondary institutions, and that's uh, leveraged over $1.2 billion in funding from other sources, so it's really demonstrating a strong return on our investment. The research capacity program supports campus Alberta institutions, so really Alberta post-secondary uh, institutions, and the researchers in acquiring either small equipment or large research infrastructure. So it provides um, some of the backbone for the equipment necessary to do the research. The program includes a college industry innovation uh, stream that supports applied research infrastructure in colleges and polytechnics. So it's not focused solely on the, the, the large research uh, universities in the province. The program has provided $6.7 million in research infrastructure funding for 31 researchers at Alberta's post-secondary institutions to pursue, pursue emerging technologies in, uh, in energy, agriculture and forestry, manufacturing, artificial intelligence, as well as, as, well as health innovation. A couple of examples. Uh, one is Dr. Chris Hurd, who is developing a sub-zero facility designed to serve as a state-of-the-art meteorite research hub working directly with NASA. So getting Alberta ingenuity into, into NASA and into the, the space and astronomy industry, uh, as well as Dr. Sasha Wilson, who co-led a panel in researching the benefits of mineral carbonation, which is an innovative technique that turns waste carbon from the atmosphere into rock. And it helps to sequester carbon in support of mitigating climate change. And uh, uh, Dr. Wilson recently uh, met with officials in the US to explain uh, this technology and its, uh, its potential in, in uh, fighting climate change. Uh, turning now to the major innovation fund, uh, the ministry awarded uh, $19.3 million over three years through this fund for three collaborative research initiatives, uh, one on autonomous systems, uh, one on quantum systems, as well as other um, innovative projects attracting more than $25 million in other funding. So uh, again, leveraging what we put into it to, to have others contribute to the outcomes. Uh, looking a little bit more at Alberta Innovates, um, and in particular, Alberta Innovates uh, and the government's uh, focus on artificial intelligence. Um, since 2002, um, we've provided approximately $58 million in funding to grow capacity for artificial intelligence, including um, uh, some of that being directed towards the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. 
Amy, as it's affectionately known, is recognized nationally and internationally as a machine learning center of excellence. As the province's technology and innovation delivery agency, Alberta Innovates will also continue to play a key role in building our strengths in technology and innovation, supporting our economic recovery through job creation, investment, and new market opportunities, focusing in five areas. The first one is advancing digital health technologies to accelerate improvements, not only in the quality um, of, and sustainability of healthcare, but also in the, in the cost effectiveness. Uh, investing in innovative hydrocarbon products that transform bitumen into non-combustion value-added materials. Leading smart agriculture research and innovation and addressing food security challenges. Uh, a lot of that being done through the Innotech facility in Vegreville, which I'm sure many people are familiar with. And supporting further development and application of artificial intelligence across sectors. So determining ways that it can be adopted by other industries to improve their competitiveness. If we can move to the next slide, please. So another uh, recent development in the innovation uh, support space is the Innovation Employment Grant. So this, um, in, in short, is a replacement for what used to be the uh, provincial uh, version of the Scientific Research and Experimental Development, or SHRED credit. Um, the Innovation Employment Grant is designed to encourage continued growth and innovation in the technology space. Um, it's designed to support small and medium-sized businesses in, that invest in this early stage research and, and uh, providing them with uh, support through a tax credit. The program launched in January of this year and it's compatible with the federal SHRED program. It puts Alberta's support for uh, scientific research and development um, at the top of the, of the list within Canada in terms of the support available through the province combined with the federal program. It provides Alberta companies with a tax credit of up to 20% of qualifying research and development expenditures. And it's targeted at supporting companies that increase R&D spending. It's really a sweet spot for this is companies that are pre-income and in the scale up phase. And as those companies um, continue to, to grow and become more successful and, and, and become more consistently profitable, um, then they start to benefit more from the lower corporate tax rate uh, at 8% in the province, which uh, is the best in, in the country. In the first year of the program, we'll be uh, making $15 million available for this program. Um, that will grow to $74 million next year, uh, followed by $77 million uh, the year after that um, towards um, providing these tax credits. Um, so not only will it help entrepreneurs and small companies commercialize research ideas, which is really what we're driving for here, um, but it also in the process uh, help them hire people, uh, creating more, more jobs, helping to reskill people and accelerate our, our economic recovery. If we could go to the next slide, please. So looking at uh, work that's ongoing uh, as we speak, um, the technology and innovation strategy is, is, a, is a body of work being led by jobs, economy, and innovation. Understanding that um, this space uh, of technology is really effective when it's applied um, and it permeates almost every other sector in our economy. Our strategy will help the province's groundbreaking companies as they push the limits of what can be. The strategy will provide guidance to government and the private sector as well as our, our, our innovation ecosystem to enhance the productivity, competitiveness, and resilience of established sectors and accelerate growth of the technology sector in the province. So a, a few highlights are, are here showing on the slide and I, I will speak to a, a couple of them uh, as well as I'll focus on a couple more in detail um, shortly. But um, the uh, additional funding uh, that has been announced in budget 2021 for Alberta Innovates, and that's targeted to, uh, to develop some accelerators, which really are there to scale up um, businesses. So not uh, an incubator where it helps a company launch, but an accelerator that takes a company that's already launched with a good idea and really uh, grow at its, its most op uh, at its best, grow to its best potential as quickly as possible. 
the intellectual property framework is work that's ongoing uh, across ministry within the government. Um, the, the development of draft options are, are underway to improve uh, intellectual property or IP commercialization. Really what this is about is turning knowledge into economic value. There's a lot of research that's done, but not always does it make it to something that can be uh, uh, turned into a business idea. The digital strategy is, is looking inwards a little bit, but it uh, will develop information technology systems to support digital interactions between Albertans and the government, trying to achieve efficiencies and cost savings at the same time as improving service delivery. And I'll talk about a couple of other things on this slide here in a moment. If we could go to the uh, next slide, please. So many of you have probably heard of Invest Alberta. Um, this is a Crown Corporation, an agency that was launched uh, at the end of July of last year, 2020. The idea behind Invest Alberta is uh, to promote Alberta on the international stage as a great place to invest and, and do business. That's, that's really it in a nutshell. But going beyond that, um, through those promotions, um, they build relationships with companies that have the ability and the interest in expanding or moving their operations to Alberta. And they work directly hand in hand with those companies, helping them to remove roadblocks that might be in the way of investing to make sure that they have all the information to make an effective investment decision. And um, working with other orders of government, both federally and, and municipally to, um, to ensure that those companies are aware of all the programming and supports available to them as well as work on what's sometimes referred to as the final mile and um, site selection and understanding where the, the facility might actually be located um, and, and what are the dynamics around that. So it's a, it's a fairly new organization, uh, but it's, um, it's already had some successes. Um, I should mention too, one of the other things it is tasked with is um, messaging again internationally to, uh, to different capital pools and, and investment communities on the performance that Alberta and Alberta companies uh, has demonstrated with respect to ESG or environmental, social and governance um, issues. So a couple of uh, examples I'll just highlight um, that Invest Alberta has uh, recently been able to, to speak to. One is the attraction of a company called Infosys, which is an international technology giant that specializes in, in digital services and consulting for businesses. And um, it has announced plans to, uh, to expand its presence in Alberta, creating 500 new jobs over the next three years in doing so. Uh, another example is a company called mCloud Technologies, which is a provider of asset management solutions, uh, really focused on resource extraction. And it combines the internet of things, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and analytics. Um, and it has signed contracts with Alberta companies to provide services, as well as uh, announced that it will be relocating its head offices to Calgary, uh, creating further jobs here um, and building upon its already successful pre presence in the province. Next slide, please. Uh, you may recall on the slide uh, previous that talked about the technology and innovation strategy there was uh, one of the boxes talked about recapitalizing uh, AEC, which stands for the Alberta Enterprise Corporation. The government is providing an additional $175 million to Alberta Enterprise Corporation um, to make sure that it can continue to, to invest in technology companies. So uh, AEC, as we refer to it, is a funder of funds. So it invests in venture capital funds that have offices in Alberta. And then those funds subsequently invest in companies that are early stage or startups in Alberta. And what this results in is the attraction of, of not only venture capital funds to operate and provide capital in the province, um, but it leverages our investment by them bringing money to the table as well and making sure there overall is a larger capital pool in the, uh, in the province available to our entrepreneurs. And uh, in fact, there was an announcement just happened to come out earlier today um, by the Canadian Venture Capital and Private Equity Association. Um, and it, uh, it talked about Alberta leading um, Canada's um, venture capital um, attraction uh, in 2020. 
uh, doubled it uh, with $455 million in deals uh, in, in Alberta last year. So, so the activity of, of Alberta Enterprise Corporation, plus obviously many private corporations in this space uh, is really making a difference. Um, one recent investment by uh, Alberta Enterprise Corporation was with a company called uh, Innovia. Um, Innovia Capital Growth Fund 2 will support technology companies that uh, are scaling beyond the startup stage. Innovia has offices in Calgary, and uh, it's been involved in some of our, our recent Canadian tech success stories, such as Simon, Top Hat, DriveWise, Neo Financial, and Lightspeed. So uh, again, this, this recapitalization um, is expected to create uh, access to an additional 550 to $700 million of private investment, again, leveraging our efforts to make sure that there's growth capital available for successful companies. Uh, final slide, please. So together, all of these actions will help us build on our province's strengths and to grow and diversify our economy. Um, these underpin uh, the Alberta Recovery Plan and the government's broad reaching uh, plan to help us uh, recover and, and grow uh, after the, uh, the COVID or as the pandemic uh, um, winds down. Uh, but, but also during these, these times, we're also taking action to make sure that there's um, resiliency during this time. These initiatives will help us to attract additional investment and world-class talent to the province. They'll encourage the growth of spin-off industries. And most importantly, will create new opportunities for local entrepreneurs that will create jobs for everyone right here in the province. So The, uh, we're now going to move over to a topic that's been garnering a lot of attention as of late, which is low Earth orbital satellites, and are they coming to our rescue? Uh, we've heard quite a bit of conversation about this already, but I'm happy to introduce Mark Wolf, who is the Chief Technology Officer for Cybera's National Networking Partner, Canary. Uh, Mark, I'll throw it to you and, and allow you to introduce your, your panel for this topic today. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Very excited to be here and discussing low <clears throat> Earth orbit satellites. Um, my role at Canary allows me to look at technologies and uh, Canary and Cybera, both of us are interested in the, the possibility of better connecting to data uh, via other methods that we have from what we have today. One of those being uh, low Earth orbit or LEO. And we've been following uh, the progress, the fast progress of LEOs for some time. I would uh, say that Cybera has definitely been uh, among the leaders in keeping an eye on this space. And so very excited that we're at the point where we can talk quite um, uh, practically about LEOs. So we have a panel uh, to discuss LEOs in more detail. And uh, luckily we have a great diverse panel. Uh, so we have uh, different points of view. I'm going to introduce the panel and then uh, we'll uh, have some discussions on, on Leo. So I'll start with uh, Michelle Beck. Michelle, uh, unmute please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Michelle Beck. I'm the vice president of North American sales here at Telesat. Um, an engineer by trade. I've spent uh, the last 15 years here at Telesat uh, with a focus on uh, connecting uh, a lot of these uh, northern and remote communities. Today we do it over GEO. In the future, uh, we'll be doing it over our LEO constellation. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, next up, uh, stay, uh, Jamin Lefebvre. Jamin. Thanks, Mark. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, Jamin Lefebvre, Director of IT for Wild Rose School Division. Uh, coming up on almost two decades uh, of working in IT in, uh, in K-12 education in Alberta, predominantly rural. And uh, so my background is uh, remembering we had a school in a, in a community called Lindale, Alberta, so in between Drayton Valley and, and Edmonton. Um, and being able to shuffle all those kids into the school uh, to, to share a point-to-point -point tower that the school division had built that maybe at times could get one to five megabits per second, and they would get one hour a day when the, the line of sight would line up magically. And if it didn't work, the kids would just be sad and just leave the, the computer lab. And subsequent to that, we, uh, we saw a change to the Alberta Supernet, which, which transformed the landscape in Alberta 
to give us, you know, at the time was five megabits per second fiber to every single school and, and allowed really the, a lot of the public sector in Alberta to leapfrog um, what was going on globally, especially in rural Alberta. And, and so here we are almost two decades later of, of Supernet uh, having transformed Alberta. And we're looking at what is the next generation uh, to prevent the, the urban uh, rural digital divide and to make sure that we're connecting Canadians across Canada. Thank you, Jamin. Uh, last but not least, Joel Templeman. Joel? Hello, uh, I come with a background of education, uh, a dozen years in, uh, in K-12 education, uh, and then another dozen years uh, working with the federal government in uh, IT uh, as a, as a I, I CTO, basically. And uh, most recently doing work with uh, local nonprofits, small business, um, and uh, and the educational field, uh, digital literacy, uh, most recently. Thank you, Joel. All right, so now that we've done uh, introductions, I think we should introduce the technology. And I think I'll uh, ask Michelle to give us a brief. Uh, I'm sure uh, this is something you can do quite easily. So I I'd be interested in what Leo is and perhaps where does Leo operate? Sure. Uh, so um, I'll describe uh, LEO generally. It's a low Earth orbit. Uh, they're typically constellations of uh, satellites. Um, uh, when we talk about uh, the Telesat uh, LEO uh, network, it's, it's called uh, Telesat Lightspeed. Uh, it is a global state-of-the-art broadband infrastructure. Uh, it consists of 298 highly advanced uh, satellites uh, that uh, fly at about a thousand kilometers. Uh, and LEO constellations are anywhere from 500 to approximately 1300 kilometers. Uh, the advantage of low earth orbit satellite constellations uh, is they are extremely low latency. Um, and so they uh, basically operate something like a fiber network uh, providing uh, broadband uh, you know, gigabit uh, per second speeds or capabilities, um, low latency, uh, highly resilient. Uh, so LEO constellations comprise of a very significant number of satellites and there is inherent redundancy uh, in, that, um, in, in that constellation in that network. Um, one of the advantages that the Telesat uh, LEO constellation has is we also link uh, each satellite via optical uh, intersatellite links, which creates an IP mesh network in the sky. Um, and that has the advantage of adding a high degree of resiliency and robustness to the network. Uh, that actually combined with redundancy on the landing stations um, and, and redundancy uh, with fiber links to a point of presence, and that's where customers will connect uh, in the south uh, to the internet. Um, it just means that it's a very highly robust, highly resilient uh, platform. Uh, the, uh, the Telesat Leo constellation will be able to uh, support the 50 by 10 megabit per second connections uh, to households through uh, internet service providers. We'll talk about that a little bit um, in a little in a little bit of a uh, or later on in this session. Um, and it can scale up to um, multiple gigabits. Uh, in fact, multiple tens of gigabits. Uh, that's how uh, powerful uh, our constellation is. Um, it also supports affordable, uh, competitive. LTE and 5G offerings where it is actually uneconomic to deploy the backhaul connectivity uh, to connect uh, rural, remote, uh, northern regions of Canada. Um, so uh, so the, the typically LEO constellations, uh, like I'll say, they're, they're broadband networks <laughs> providing low latency connectivity. Uh, they are typically global. Uh, Telesat's constellation does provide global connectivity from pole to pole over every uh, ocean. And so there isn't a single point on Earth that cannot receive a broadband signal or connectivity. Um, it's a very powerful network. 
Great, thanks, Michelle. Um, we, we obviously have one, uh, we're delighted to have one uh, uh, Leo vendor here. We don't have all of them, uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's talk about a little bit about uh, what Michelle mentioned, which was how the service is offered. So Telesat has one model. We'll get back to Michelle to talk about that a little bit. I'm gonna ask Jamin if he could uh, explain his uh, experience with uh, one of the competitors to uh, Telesat, which is Starlink. Jamin, would you, do you wanna talk about uh, the, I guess the user view of, of how this works? Yeah, uh, so uh, a friend had asked me if he should uh, jump in and investigate. So he, uh, he commutes between Rocky Mountain House and Nordig, so uh, about another 100 kilometers west of Rocky, um, which, which currently is targeted by Clearwater County's uh, fiber backbone project and, and an interim solution of, uh, of um, towers. And uh, so he decided he would make the leap and uh, it arrived, I think it was a Tuesday, and I was going to go over to his house after work. He pinged me and said, hey, I'm going to set this thing up. And within 20 minutes later, uh, he had pinged me back and said it was up and running and operational. And that's coming from someone who was um, medium tech savvy and, and had it all up and running. Uh, speeds at the time were, were somewhere between 40 and 60, but he had obstructions. But uh, it, it's still remarkable um, to be able to see that, that the user um, was able to set that up. And it, it reminds me of a presentation that happened in Alberta by Dr. Perry Kincaid uh, in 2014 where he said that uh, we were gonna experience a revolution around data and, and that the, the end user was gonna become empowered and the end user was gonna start breaking down barriers and borders were gonna start to be eliminated. And, and Leo's really transform what we can do in terms of connectivity in, in that new paradigm that we're no longer necessarily restricted to, to what were traditional borders and boundaries to connectivity. Thank you, Jamin. So it's... Uh... The Starlink is, is a, like a consumer to the consumer type of model. Um, Michelle, how would you contrast the, the Telesat uh, delivery model? So the Telesat delivery model um, is one that uh, works in partnership with uh, ISPs, uh, carriers, you know, communities if they want to operate their own community-based um, uh, internet offering. Um, and what we do um, is we use our satellite and satellite connectivity uh, to uh, provide a broadband backhaul uh, to the uh, community. And so we replace that expensive fiber build um, or microwave build um, and provide uh, basically what we call a virtual uh, fiber connection. Um, and then we'll work with the ISP uh, who will be responsible then for the local access network. So connecting and operating the local network. Um, and that could be uh, fiber, it could be uh, wireless access, either a 4G, uh, fixed wireless access, LTE uh, connectivity uh, to be able to connect uh, the homes, uh, the businesses, uh, governments, institutions, as well as uh, you know, the mobility tower. Um, it's a, it, it provides a holistic service to be able to connect the entirety of the community. Um, and we can, again, because the, the constellation, the way that we're operating, um, it's, it's more of a carrier grade or enterprise grade service. Uh, we can support very high data rates um, and support the full requirements of the community. Um, and you know, we, can, we can support consumers uh, with the CRTC objective of a 50 by 10 service, but equally we can provide gigabit per second links to uh, hospitals or institutions, um, you know, government uh, offices. Um, and we can supply hundreds of um, megabits or gigabits that are required to the cell tower. Um, and we'll just aggregate all of that uh, at the uh, remote uh, terminal and provide that long haul or backhaul connectivity, uh, which ends up being a very uh, low cost, affordable service. Uh, it's plug and play for uh, the ISP as well, simple ethernet connections, um, but provides really a holistic solution for communities. Thank you. Yes, this uh, 
this uh, level, this enterprise level of service is something that uh, Canary and Cybera and uh, the National Research and Education Network is very interested in uh, because uh, some of our applications are uh, high speed and the, that, that uh, potential for a much larger uh, connectivity uh, rates is very attractive. So let's, let's bring Joel into the conversation. Um, Joel, uh, I think one aspect that everyone's interested in is affordability. And I understand that you've been thinking about this a little bit. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think that's the, the start off. I'm not FAS focused on the technology. I think we've all kind of looking into it and maybe it's just because we've been promised, uh, <clears throat> you know, we've had the football taken away from us so many times we're skeptical about it. But I think now that it's really rolling out, we're seeing that the technology is, you know, it's there. And when you're dealing with, uh, you know, we're dealing with companies that have been doing this in the past and you're dealing with uh, companies like Amazon and uh, SpaceX, they're, they're not just launching rockets, they're landing them on little platforms. For them. And like, I'm just going to not pick on your technology. I'm just going to move past that and say, you know, the technology is there and what we're hearing in the field right now as the Starlink is starting to roll out is that it's there. Um, I'm also not going to you know, it's, we've been starving for this for so long. Uh, you know, I'm not going to slap a sandwich out of someone's mouth and say, here, you should have a salad. If it's, if it's working, people are going to take this. Right. So I'm, I'm past the argument about the technology and I'm past the argument about, you know, is this good or bad? Technically um, it looks like, and it's moving so quickly, you know, that ship has sailed. I think we're there, but the, the, what I do think about is the next step, right. The, and the next logical step is that affordability. Uh, equity, right? So not only do we have uh, these areas that are going to uh, don't necessarily have the connectivity because of the technology, but the next reason they don't have it is for that affordability. Uh, I know that we've, you know, you get at your calculator and you can can look at how much money and subsidies have gone to uh, telecommunication companies and, you know, a lot of the process that goes through all of this over the years and those numbers rack up pretty fast. Um, there's still a good uh, cost uh, even to the Starlink, right? For the upfront for the equipment, and then uh, you know in the hundred to hundred and fifty dollar range for the monthlies, you know that's well outside of a lot of people's uh, budgeting capabilities. So even if they now can get this access, um, you know what is the government going to do for subsidies directly to the end user? Um, you know how else are we going to support this? Um, the you know we've heard throughout the the day and yesterday about the different things that are there, but what is really there for the end consumer uh, to, to make this affordable uh, as they roll out, regardless of, of which company uh, is, is doing it. Um, you know, and, and, and the competitiveness uh, argument isn't necessarily there either. Um, you know, it, it bothers me at some level that there's one international space station that we all contribute to, and there's and there's one Hubble telescope that we internationally contribute to, and then now we have at least four different uh, systems that are, you know, competing in the, in space, you know, and at some time, um, Starlink's talking about, you know, up to 42,000 flying routers in the sky, uh, you know, like there's, there's a little bit of that on the technology side that's concerning, but practically I'm, I'm more interested in how we're going to, uh, afford this, uh, at the end user level, regardless of if it's, uh, direct to user model, or if it's, a uh, a local WISP that's doing it, there's, those costs are still probably the next most important thing to talk about. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Jamin, do you have any uh, comments on affordability? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll echo the same sentiment from Joel. I mean, uh, it's not necessarily within everyone's range, um, but I, I will speak to people who, who I'm familiar with in, in rural Alberta. So uh, a friend of mine who set up uh, Starlink and, and was getting speeds after he removed his obstructions was getting reliably 100 to 140 megabits per second um, latency in the 50 to 70s, although uh, Elon did tweet that they hope to see those those latency numbers down to approximately 20 milliseconds, which which rivals Alberta Supernet, uh, you know, fiber to the prem uh, numbers already in, in this year. And uh, so, so my friend the next day had actually gone out on site to, uh, to a, a, another friend's house, uh, less than 10 minutes out of town, no direct line of sight, so sort of in a valley. And, you know, this would be an area that would probably fall under a general coverage map um, 
under under traditional you know services like Sierra and stuff because other people within that cluster would probably have reliable speeds and uh his friend was getting 1.2 megabits down sub 0.6 up and and so for people who need that connectivity um waiting for another solution or another provider isn't really something that they're interested in so for them to make that investment when you have rural property and it now becomes part of your business and part of your lifestyle uh, access to telehealth access to government services it, it's worth it um, it becomes something that is no longer uh, a question and and so it, it does challenge traditional customer acquisition costs in terms of if, if the if the cost is sunk by a, a provider of leos the, the cost to, to acquire another customer within that same zone is relatively low compared to a traditional fiber build out. So it doesn't necessarily mean it, it disrupts or replaces a traditional build out, but it certainly could maybe service some of the outliers. So, you know, I was having a discussion recently about uh, Saskatchewan crossing. So uh, a little venue in between halfway between um, Banff and Jasper. And, you know, I went there hiking two years ago and tried to meet up with a friend and the friend wasn't there. And I'm trying to text the friend, can't text the friend. And while there is some semblance of Wi-Fi, it's restricted and unavailable to customers who are, who are trying to access it. And so immediately when you start to look at these really remote places where there's struggling businesses that need that connectivity, it's unlikely there's going to be a fiber build out going into Banff National Park to service one small hotel gas station. And so there is a place where Leos can immediately disrupt uh, the lack of a traditional incumbent provider. Thanks, Jamin. So uh, Michelle, I guess uh, it's pretty obvious that it is a game changer in a lot of places that have to use uh, geostationary uh, uh, satellites today and all the inherent delays and lower transmission speeds, et cetera. So it, it's uh, a much cheaper solution. Uh, it's, it'll be transformational compared to traditional uh, geo services. Um, and in fact, you know, the government of Canada saw the promise uh, to be able to connect um, and bridge the digital divide in some of the hardest to reach areas of Canada. And Telesat and the government of Canada actually partnered uh, late last year. Uh, the final announcement uh, or the final agreement was announced uh, late last year. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, the, the, it is the, the intent of the government to use uh, the Telesat light speed uh, Leo network to bring affordable high speed internet uh, and wireless connectivity to rural uh, remote northern areas of Canada um, and uh, and to do it on a very affordable basis. Um, the requirement is to make available a 50 by 10 service. So we are working with uh, various ISPs, uh, carriers, uh, potentially communities that want access to this connectivity. Um, we just went through a round of universal broadband uh, funding applications as well for many of these, uh, these groups and they've applied uh, to have uh, just even that remote terminal cost and some of the build out of the local access network covered by uh, the federal government. And so you know, our partnership on the service side combined with a further um, subsidy on the local access network and the remote terminal will enable um, communities uh, to be fully connected and holistically, um, which leads to uh, some uh, significant be benefits, uh, you know, in terms of connecting uh, households, businesses, uh, but once you connect that wireless tower as well and enable, you know, Wi-Fi or uh, 4G, 5G uh, services, um, you enhance essentially the, the security of, um, of those local inhabitants uh, as well, because they've got at least cell coverage when they step outside of their homes and their businesses. So that's one of the key advantages that we have uh, through our holistic uh, community aggregator solution over and above what um, uh, a service you would get that is just direct to consumer. So that we feel that that, that is a, a significant advantage to connecting communities. Thank you, Michelle. So you, you spoke about uh, the, the change uh, uh, in those communities. I'm gonna uh, ask Joel, uh, we had discussed uh, 
development opportunities, N not necessarily just those around having internet access, but the fact that you have uh, this service being made available, that there's development uh, potential around Leos themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where you, you start looking into not just the affordability, but the economics in a, in a bigger uh, part of it. And that's to, to build off what Michelle was saying, you know, having that local model where you're working with local WISPs or you've got uh, community groups or rural municipalities or co-ops who are looking at that local build, um, there's development there, right? Then, And that money, more importantly, stays in the community, right? So you've got maybe you don't have enough uh, to, to build a business right now. Um, but this, because the best you're going to do is a, a trickling of internet and there's not enough to share. But once, once the bandwidth issue is, has been solved or patched or whatever, you, you've got somewhere to build off of, right? So you can work with these groups and start, you know, you're hiring a local workforce and your customers are paying local. Uh, one of the concerns I have with the uh, direct to customer um, through Starlink is that that money is leaving the community, right? That money is leaving the country, um, that is, you know, when it comes to the bigger picture of economics, um, rural Canada doesn't need more money leaving their community. Uh, it needs more money coming in, right? And yes, once you have that connectivity, you know, it opens up, it opens up all of that, you know, business opportunity as well. You can be anywhere and work. You know, some you could work for a Toronto company as a programmer in a rural situation, but again. And the technology is starting to get there, but you need reliability. If your business is going to rely on cloud services, that doesn't just have to be fast. It has to be there all the time and when you need it, right? So there are other issues of, of the, the reliability side of it there. So all of, the, all of the different aspects of technology are improving and, and need to be there. What I hope we start talking about as well in parallel is the development of those, those skills, right? So businesses that traditionally don't have uh, technology capability or internet connectivity. Um, you don't just do that overnight. You don't just suddenly have an e-business overnight, right? So those those digital literacy skills and those business skills, which are slightly different than you need for that face-to-face, -face, those need to develop. These are in communities that have not had this, right? If, if you're in an urban center and the business is around you, if you can just click some buttons on your screen and things come to your door, that infrastructure doesn't exist. It can, and it can, needs to be developed. Um, so it's a great, great economic opportunities uh, within the communities. But these systems that, that we are privileged to have need to be developed and they come with skills that need to start being processed. So what I hope is that we realize that, and it, it's a chicken and the egg thing, right? You, somewhere along the line, we have to infuse some, uh, some funding into this. We need to infuse some uh, leadership and some uh, programming to help people get that ball rolling. And then once that ball is rolling, you know, then you've got your uh, economic base that you can continue it on, right? But we have to kind of start the rock rolling. Thanks, Joel. So, uh, Jamin, the, uh, um, Joel's introduced a little bit of adoption, I guess, and, and maybe digital literacy. Uh, we are, we're also talking about development. Any, uh, any, thoughts on uh, the opportunities there that this brings and, and maybe maybe more maybe caution too I, i'm not sure yeah I, I think joel was was hitting on some of the you know let's let's look at the potential risks and i mean one of them immediately that comes up that, that Mark, joel talked about was uh, the economic straw that's that's sucking uh, dollars out of rural communities and and adding concentration to i mean frankly right now elon musk tentatively the richest man on the planet. Um, but, you know, there, there's other risks that come with it. And, and some of the risks are, you know, Elon tweeted in February that uh, every major satellite network that has attempted this has gone bankrupt. And we saw that with OneWeb late last year um, until the UK government came in and picked that one up. And, and so putting all of our eggs into an Elon Musk basket brings with it the potential risk that what if it all fails? Is, is Canada's rural community Going to, going to stick all of its economic future on Elon Musk's network. And one of the conversations I have with my friends that uh, it, it centers around a, a fairly famous quote uh, from a Canadian, which is uh, the medium is the message and uh, sort of alludes to the fact that uh, what's going on around us in terms of societal transformation is a reflection of the technology 
and, and how it impacts us, not necessarily from the bits and bytes, but, but from how society is changing. And, and so are we going to allow rural Canadians to, to exist on a totally separate network from the rest of, of uh, urban Canada, experiencing the internet differently, experiencing the internet at the whim of Elon Musk or, or other entrepreneurs, Virgin, for example? Or is there, is there some national interest of Canada to provide the, the, the same internet experience for Canadians that are connected in the same way? And, uh, and I, I think when you start to look at, does this impact students in, in Wild Rural School Division in Rocky Mountain House, Alberta? I think it absolutely does. And there's implications that go down the road far beyond just getting commodity internet to people's homes. It's, it's the real long-term impact of what are we doing as a nation to ensure that we have safe, reliable connectivity for economic development and, and like I say, medicine and, and an education. Right. So, Michelle, when you were discussing uh, the, the deployment model, you, you talked about potential local opportunities. You know, you had said that it's ISPs and, and, and telcos, but, but you mentioned, you know, communities. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So, um, so even today, we do a fair amount of work with, uh, with local uh, communities and community leaders uh, that uh, have um, actually launched their own uh, community-based ISPs, uh, and today we deliver connectivity uh, via our geo uh, satellites. In the future, we will be doing that uh, on Leo. Um, but uh, importantly, they want to own, they want to operate the infrastructure. Um, they want to uh, manage it. They want to train uh, youth in the community uh, with IT skills. Uh, that will uh, own and operate uh, that uh, local telecommunications infrastructure. Um, and that includes, you know, the wireless uh, access networks, and some of them are operating their own sort of, you know, 4G and 5, what eventually 5G services. Uh, they manage and maintain uh, the satellite uh, remote uh, terminal infrastructure. Um, and as well, uh, they provide IT support within the community, providing, um, uh, you know, just sort of call center and, and uh, deployment to uh, households, but also to the schools and businesses, um, keeping uh, essentially uh, the youth and an upcoming generation uh, well versed in technology uh, to, uh, with a goal to uh, train them and uh, to keep them employed. Uh, so there are real opportunities uh, there just in terms of the infrastructure. Um, and then equally, when we, when we look at just the, the service um, altogether and tell us at light speed, we are a Canadian company. Uh, we've been around for 50 years. Uh, we've supported the industry for the past uh, 50 years and we support our client base. So if there is uh, ever an issue uh, with either, you know, the service and you need uh, the technical support, uh, we're here. We've got, you know, feet and boots on the ground uh, that can go in uh, and help with uh, any, um, and help with any, um, any service uh, or service support. Um, I was just monitoring sort of some of the, the questions as well and in, in, the, in the chat group. There's one point that I want to raise as well. Um, so, you know, the most of the constellations are global in nature. Um, they, they need to be. Uh, some, uh, though, have full global coverage. Some only have partial coverage. It just depends how you've architected the constellation. Um, but that being said, uh, we can uh, get revenue and you cover basically your investment costs not just by serving and focusing in on solely a Canadian market. We're looking at provided, providing services globally. And so the markets that we're looking at are in fact global. And for Telesat, we're going after uh, government um, and you know, defense customers. We're going after uh, aero and maritime customers that don't have any other options but to use satellite. And these are very large enterprise-based and grade customers. They help to subsidize the overall uh, cost and the capacity of that constellation. And that's how we can uh, effectively bring 
affordable connectivity to uh, communities and to uh, more of the consumer-based market uh, out there. So it's just something I wanted to raise. Right, okay, thank you. So uh, I do note that we're getting a bunch of questions, so I'll make sure that we have enough time to answer them. Uh, I'm gonna warn Michelle, just looking at the questions, there's a lot, lot that'll be uh, towards you, but um, before we get to that, um, uh, lots of uh, points that you made, Michelle, about the ability to plan, train, deploy on, on, on the actual LEO portion of it, in addition to the internet. Uh, Joel, did, did you have any uh, comments about this aspect of, uh, of the opportunity? About support to the technology itself? Yeah, yeah, like the ability for, for um, people to be able to adopt the technology in, in communities, et cetera. Well, that's, that's the different levels, right? So and you're, you, you're going into a place that we kind of just uh, have traditionally for all this time, you know, there hasn't been a lot of connectivity you got that chicken and egg problem. So you don't have a lot of usage, you don't have a lot of devices. And then all of a sudden, boom, like overnight, you've got the ability to connect, right? So you could, you've just jump started this, the, the first part of it, and you're, you're into the next part, right? So the skills, uh, the local technical skills, right? And if, if you're a technician in the rural environment right now, they're aren't hundreds of you, right? There's a few, and then the rest have gone somewhere else to seek that employment, right? Because they don't have the connectivity to work remotely. So you don't necessarily have that uh, developed of the workforce in the, on the technical side. And then just as users, all right? So uh, as users uh, have skills and, and develop those things, they need access to that training. Um, the, what brought me to a lot of this work is, is trying to change the way that learning is done in school. Um, there's, you know, the, and the COVID-19 has, has brought that argument right to the forefront and right literally to a, a lot of our doorsteps uh, with learning from home, um, good and bad. Uh, but those take a huge amount of skill. The, the, that's an entirely different skill set for the, for the educator and for the learner, uh, different, different types of things that people will have to develop and as students will have to develop as they go forward. These are all positives. These are all things that we need to develop anyway. There's more collaboration in work any work, um, you know, businesses, arguably there are all businesses are technical businesses in some way, having, having to have technical systems uh, support what they do. Um, but those are skills that uh, haven't necessarily been in places that haven't had this connectivity. Um, so again, what are we gonna do? There's been a, an abrupt shift, like it's a good shift, it's positive. Um, it's the, um, you know, like Paul said from RMA too, every, every, everything you're working on seems to be one degree away from a technology problem. But as we're solving technology problems, we're moving them onto human problems. So where are those programs uh, so people can learn those skills? Um, and uh, as Jamin was saying too, we were talking about, you know, those safety skills, those simple uh, scamming and access to your uh, systems, uh, you know, and if, if underskilled, technically underskilled people are popping up um, servers and data centers, you know, are they are they secure? You know, the, all of those types of um, technical and user skills that we take for granted in places that have slowly developed uh, this access over time um, is there's a there's a risk there that people are going to be thrust into a position um, that maybe they're, they're not ready for. Right, so we. What I, what I want from that is not to say, stop, don't do this, everyone back in their hidey hole, everything's fine, uh, is to just think proactively about that and, and do that concurrently with this. Right, so, so Jamin, how to that uh, point, how is Leo gonna change uh, how your school board or school boards, uh, remote ones in particular, do their job and, and give uh, students access? So, I mean, going back to, to the last year, going, you know, for fe from February of last year, <clears throat> uh, you know, we, we did gather some data uh, for, for some different presentations and some and some media releases within Alberta. And to our surprise, we, were, we had found that approximately 98% of our students were actually able to, to have what they would consider connectivity uh, at home in some sort of facet. Um, what became really interesting is that 
from there, the stories that we heard was a significant portion of that 98%, so upwards of in the 50 percentile range, um, had had internet, but did but had capacity limitations, and it really started hitting home. One of our principals actually did a did an interview with um, CBC, and and expressed how it, it actually became a mental health challenge for the families at home, uh, because one one child would be trying to meet with their class on say a Google Meet or a Teams. And another child in the home would then connect and steal the bandwidth and that kid, the other child and the sibling was unable to meet with their class that day and then was disheartened because they felt behind. And, you know, so then they had this, this feeling of I'm never going to be able to catch up to my classmates I missed the teacher's lessons. Um, so now all of a sudden those students who don't have the capacity are doing things in, in a, an, an asynchronous manner offline. Uh, coming to the school off hours to get materials. And so they really, there was a huge divide, regardless of the fact that somewhere on a piece of paper, anecdotally, my principals had said they believe 98% of kids did have some form of access. Um, it, it's, a, it's a real stretch and a, and a real continuum from what 98% means uh, in terms of being able to connect. And, you know, we, we saw in Alberta, um, which is interesting, some of the ransomware and, and, uh, and uh, financial system scams that happened over the past five years is uh, targeted approaches. So uh, Alberta Infrastructure releases capital projects publicly because that's what they do. They celebrate capital projects and subsequently online scammers would target those institutions directly. So post-secondary institutions with large capital projects, um, trying to get them to pay fake invoices, incorrect invoices, whaling, uh, spear phishing, those types of attacks. And uh, in volunteering with Cybera, as they uh, as they work to connect some of these First Nations organizations in in Alberta over the past half decade, um, they found that online scammers started to follow the connectivity maps of these previously disconnected and underserved areas of the province, and would directly start to target them because they felt what well, they knew that there was going to be low digital fluency, and so you would see this resurgence of the Nigerian Prince type scams that were going into these First Nations communities because they had a lack of digital literacy online. They didn't know, they didn't have that experience, and and so hand in hand with let's just wrap everybody up and get them connected. We need to make sure, again, I'll speak to the word safely. Are we doing it in a moderated way where we're putting people safely onto the internet? Nice. So yeah, it's obvious that for all the, all the you know, simplicity, I guess, that the technology allows, you, know, you get a connection and, and you get a better connection. There's a lot of uh, aspects that we should be uh, uh, keeping in mind as this, uh, these services become available. So I think we've got some questions that we can go to, but before we do that, uh, does anyone have uh, any final comments that they would like to make uh, that we may have missed already? If not, we'll uh, go to the questions. I just, I just wanted to follow up on that and, and not repeat the mistakes that we did before. And I say this from a, an urbanite who, this is fairly new to me and the idea of the thinking is that, you know, I never considered the rural uh, point of view and a lot of the projects are urban pushed on to rural as opposed to rural knowing what they need and what they're capable of and the speed that they can travel and what the resources are and being able to lead that way so in this in what i'm saying like where are these things i think we definitely need to take that leadership also from from the the, the local uh area because they're they're going to be different they're going to have different capacities, right? So let's let's not be pushing things uh, and assumptions from the urban experience into into rural or or low economic areas or places that don't have this. Um, it didn't work before, and it, we can only assume it, it won't work as well in this too. So listening to each of the communities and knowing that the what impl implementations look like in different places will look different, right? But ultimately, trying to be equal as far as the impact and what we do. Anybody else? Okay, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll read the questions. Um, uh, they've been moderated for me um, by uh, uh, Laura at Cybera. So thank you, Laura. Um, question one, uh, I think Michelle, which ISPs are working now with Telesat? I would probably suggest Western Canada uh, perspective? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, we have services uh, today with a number of what I would say the, the larger existing carriers. Um, 
primarily providing uh, trunking uh, right, right now today with, uh, for telephony uh, services. So serving uh, you know, regions uh, just with telephony trunks in Western uh, Canada. Uh, we do provide some connectivity. And I said, the majority of what we do in terms of broadband connectivity is uh, East or Manitoba and Eastward and all throughout the North. Uh, those are our primary uh, markets today. Um, so I would say, you know, Man all of Northern Manitoba, all of Northern, uh, Northern Ontario, uh, Northern Quebec and all throughout the territories. Those are our primary markets today. Okay, uh, next question. And I think it'll be Michelle again. Um, how can multiple satellite networks be economically viable when the current telcos uh, uh, are, are having some trouble with uh, you know, the existing um, models? I think you mentioned uh, it's about scale. Is there any, anything else to add? Yeah, well, it's about scale and it's about going after different, um, uh, different market verticals. Uh, so Starlink is going after a direct-to-consumer model. Um, and where it makes sense for Starlink uh, to hit are households that are not part of communities. Uh, you know, uh, households that are, uh, you know, far from any community, any wireless connection uh, or any fiber uh, connectivity. So where there is absolutely no density uh, that would even support uh, wireless access. Uh, so that's typically where a direct-to-user type of service shines. Um, and again, they're looking at the global market um, and there are areas around the globe that would uh, definitely require that service. Uh, Telesat's focus is on uh, enterprise uh, markets uh, and dealing directly with carriers, ISPs, um, you know, integrators, resellers, and that's kind of a dedicated market in itself. We're not really crossing paths here. So, you know, you could support, and I think that the world is a, is a, a large market. We know there are, you know, upwards of three point some odd billion, um, you know, uh, households, users, uh, schools, you know, government institutions, uh, research institutions, just like, you know, Canary needs in the middle of nowhere that requires broadband connectivity. Is there room for multiple providers? Yes, uh, there is in our view, um, as long as, uh, you know, they're going after uh, disparate uh, um, uh, markets. Um, is, uh, I'll paraphrase this one. Is there any difference at all using this network uh, with, a, with a fiber network or, or an existing telecommunication network in terms of things like being able to put a virtual private network across it or any advanced networking? Is there any difference? There's no difference. I mean, when we call it virtual fiber, it truly is fiber light. We follow all of the same standards uh, that carriers follow when they... Uh, install and deliver uh, fiber uh, connectivity services. Uh, so our, um, our uh, uh, platform is fully MEF compliant, Metro Ethernet form compliant, just like the carriers. Uh, so technically there is no difference. Okay. Again, I'm gonna paraphrase the next question. Uh, I think it's some confusion over the fact that the satellites are moving all around. Uh, so, um, is, is, is there any, anything that a user sees because of the satellites moving or is it just what I would call uh, auto magic? It's auto magic. Um, I, you know, uh, the, the antenna on the ground needs to track those antennas in motion or the satellites in motion. Um, and so there are essentially two, there are actually three types of antennas, um, but uh, the uh, Starlink antenna um, is um, an electronically steered antenna, sort of phased array, um, but then it also has a mechanical component to it that will also mechanically um, move it or pan across. So it's a hybrid version. Um, when we're talking about connecting communities uh, ourselves, we want to do uh, high efficiency 
um, or use very high efficiency technologies. And we're looking at using two uh, parabolic antennas. That's what the terminal is. They're small, they're protected under ray domes um, and that would create basically the terminal. And so one would be tracking the satellite that you're receiving and transmitting to. The other one would lock on to the next satellite coming over the horizon and then just do a transparent switch. Um, no lost data, there's, there's nothing lost, it's transparent to the user, but that's how you get uh, constant connectivity to the satellites that are in constant motion. Okay. Again, I warned you, there'd be a lot of questions your way. Here's another one. Um, uh, when will Telesat services be available uh, to, to Canada? Uh, so 2024 is our is our service launch date. Uh, 2023 will uh, begin uh, beta testing uh, with uh, several of our uh, large uh, customers, um, and that's the um, we're going to be launching our satellites in stages. The polar constellation will be uh, the first constellation to launch. Um, we have also an inclined. Uh, constellation. So in 2023, we'll be doing beta testing, very similar to what uh, Starlink uh, did originally. And 2024, uh, we'll be in full service uh, first quarter um, uh, with the polar constellation high latitude service and towards the end of the year, full global coverage. Okay. Um, again, for you, Michelle, I think, uh, so uh, a feature of some satellite or, or even, um, I guess, point-to-point -point microwave technology is uh, being affected by rain or snow. Is that uh, something that LEOs are affected by? So LEOs less so uh, than a geosatellite. And the reason is um, the, they're tracking uh, satellites that are in constant motion in the sky. Uh, and so... Um, one of the benefits there, um, and there are multiple satellites in the sky, so you can actually uh, use that, uh, uh, the, the user terminal, um, and it will detect if it's being impacted by weather and can actually start to uh, receive and transmits its signal to uh, satellites that are, um, that are away from a rain event or a, a significant snow event. Um, services are more uh, apt to be affected by rain than they are by snow, uh, first and foremost. Um, but again, because they're in constant motion, because the satellite constellation is much closer to Earth, um, because we've got redundancy at uh, the landing stations, gateways, and the pops, uh, there's a tremendous amount of resiliency and uh, backup uh, that will address any type of impact uh, that weather events would have typically had on a geo service. So a lot more robust, actually, more resilient. Okay. So uh, moving from a technical question to one of uh, maybe, maybe uh, more of a, like a cost basis here. Uh, the question is, um, uh, so some, some communities that have fiber, uh, communities that don't have existing fiber um, uh, would be one of the main uh, recipients of the government funding uh, or subsidy. Um, is there any difference if, if they do already have access to fiber? Is, is there like a, a hierarchy in terms of ability to, to participate? Yeah, so, so if they already have fiber, then they're not eligible to receive um, this funded pool of capacity uh, that has been funded by the federal government. The, really, the goal of this uh, pool is to connect those communities that don't have any fiber connectivity today. Um, and so it's to really bridge uh, the gap there. Now, that being said, we can look at uh, opportunities and, and a lot of the communities that do have fiber don't have um, backups or resiliency. Um, they don't have a fiber ring. And so the Leo constellation can actually be used to provide that backup connectivity when they need it. And there's two models there. Um, you can procure a small amount of, uh, of capacity 
um, and have it kind of always on and that becomes your emergency backup in the event that the fiber goes down. Um, or uh, if there is a fiber break, uh, then you can uh, purchase uh, you know, from time to time what you need then to um, uh, and provision it, which you'll be able to do almost in real time uh, just provision that pool of capacity. As long as you've got the terminal in the community, you can light it up and then provide the backup required uh, when your fiber goes down. Okay. Uh, this one is on, uh, again, for you, Michelle, on uh, providing global connectivity. So how, how do you uh, access foreign markets uh, or how, 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 do you, how do you make it all work at worldwide? It seems pretty daunting. Uh, it is daunting, but we're a global satellite operator today and we've actually negotiated landing rights um, and rights to operate in a significant number of countries already. Um, you know, today we fly uh, 15 uh, geo satellites uh, with a footprint that is global. Uh, we have customers on every continent um, and we're used to dealing with uh, all of the local administrations. We have staff that do uh, negotiate those rights and we're doing that today with Leo. Um, in terms of just the, the regulatory um, aspects, uh, you know, we, we did, um, it's the ITU and I did see part of the question they were asking is that the International Telecommunication Union that kind of manages those access rights. Um, they don't. What they manage are the uh, frequency um, and the priorities to those frequencies, um, which Telesat um, had the forethought years and years ago to apply for those frequency rights. And so we have uh, priority rights uh, to that spectrum globally. Uh, so any uh, entity that wants to operate a Leo constellation using the KA band frequencies absolutely needs to coordinate with us. We have priority over that. Okay, let's uh, let's keep going. I've been told that if uh, you know, uh, we'll go a little over time. Um, so this this is a um, interesting question. Um, I guess they're talking about uh, how does how do Leos impact space operations for other things like launches to the to the uh, space station, etc. So, so the Leo satellites actually fly at higher altitudes than the space station. So, uh, technically, there is uh, no um, no risk of uh, of interfering. Uh, when the uh, rockets are in fact launched, that is a well-coordinated uh, activity with a clear uh, launch, uh, launch and traje trajectory paths. Um, and uh, like I said, we've been launching uh, our own geostationary satellites for uh, decades uh, using various uh, launch providers, um, including uh, way back, we were on uh, launch some of our satellites on the space shuttle. Um, so um, interestingly, I mean, it, it, we've been doing it for years. Um, is there a concern with the growing number of Leo constellations? Absolutely. Um, you know, being in this business for the past 50 years, we, um, I would say, are um, sort of the um, uh, we don't want to call ourselves kind of the older company, but we feel that we take um, uh, a more responsible approach uh, to our constellation. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't envision uh, launching and flying 30,000 satellites uh, in space. That, that does concern us. Um, you know, we, we've designed the satellites to be much more capable um, and we can actually uh, address a uh, global market um, and deliver substantial significance, like, you know, terabits of connectivity globally, uh, just with our uh, 298 satellites. Um, and, uh, and again, we've been, uh, we've been a very responsible uh, service provider over the past 50 years, and we'll continue to act that way in the future. Joel, you had something to 
Yeah, I've been kind of watching the chat as well. And I think this is this is something that we didn't get a chance to talk about. And I'm sure we won't right now. But just something that we have to have in mind is governance, especially, you know, it's the first thought that comes in mind when it comes to Starlink. Like, you know, everyone seems to be focused on the the, um, the technology. And I, you know, I spent a lot of time recently just trying to get an answer to this, too. And, and you see pages and pages about speeds and connectivity and, you know, access where it's where you can get this. But this is kind of going out there fast and we we already don't have a good governance uh over telecommunications that's a pretty consistent conversation right now uh now we're launching another entire vector of access and uh you know private companies having complete control over the backbone you know uh, jamin mentioned it too right like those that's something of concern. I don't know if I'm the only one concerned about this, but uh, it's definitely another whole area of policy and where the lawyers and the policy analysts and the politicians need to know and need to communicate. You know, maybe I just, you know, we're just not hearing it and they've got a perfect plan in place. It's something that I think needs to be, uh, again, happening concurrently from the leadership point of view, right? Now, there was a lot of chat, a lot in the chat about, broadband plans and you know we've had many of them come and go over time but you know now this is also outside of our jurisdiction literally it's it's you know other companies from other countries and it's not necessarily what's happening today also what happens when things are fine today and people get on and they rely on this their livelihood their business relies on this and then somebody decides to change the rules uh net neutrality you know that those legal issues are some things that definitely need to be in the forefront of discussions as well. Yes, it's a, it's a complicated environment for sure. I know that the, uh, the communications earth to the satellites are uh, national, but uh, I think there isn't an overall body that's looking necessarily at uh, overall launches, you know, who, who can launch. I could be wrong on that. Um, Speaking of launches, uh, there's a question here. What uh, what is the uh, who who is going to transport your satellites, uh, Michelle? Uh, so we're uh, just finalizing some uh, some contracts. Uh, the two companies that we've announced uh, to date um, are Blue Origin, uh, which is uh, the Jeff Bezos uh, company, New Glenn, which is a very large rocket, um, and uh, Relativity. Uh, which they were just, again, recently in the news. Uh, they um, have developed a smaller rocket and are launching nanosatellites um, out of, um, out of uh, New Zealand. There will be other announcements coming, um, but I can't, uh, I can't name them. Okay. Um, so uh, next question. Uh, so uh, is there anything that uh, that users of the network uh, have to prepare in terms of, you know, like corporate networks for for wide area solutions? So for for companies or for for school boards or you know, is uh, you've mentioned things like, you know, different use cases, I guess, and you've also mentioned that it's no different than using fiber. So is it more, uh, you know, uh, uh, looking for opportunities for resilience? Uh, looking for opportunities to maybe change some costs. Um, is is there any, you know can uh, the the exact question is uh, is there is there corporate templates for implementing WAN solutions over satellite? So I think Jamin wants to comment. Awesome, Jamin. Uh, I mean, I won't speak to corporate templates. I, I, I think when you look at traditional MPLS or, or um, SD-WAN solutions, these will work over, over the, the LEOs. Um, but, you know, in, in looking where Alberta has been with the, the luxury of the supernet, um, consolidation of, of services and centralization has already been happening in this province across the education sector for nearly a decade, uh, at least in my school authority. And so trying to transition from requiring VPNs or requiring MPLS and requiring SD-WANs in order to, to have your network available should be a strategy uh, for anyone who's considering, you know, moving out uh, and, and accessing or having work from home uh, over Leo's. So, you know, there was a, there was a meme that kind of went around about who was your champion of your, uh, your technology innovation in your company and had a bunch of things, CIO, you know, CEO, and then the final one was COVID-19, right? And so in a lot of respects, 
organizations have had to be aggressive on the innovation side because of the, the flip to work from home and at home learning or whatever your, your business model is. And so, you know, we're starting to see the cloud vendors. So I, I noticed uh, Cloudflare released a, a product called Cloudflare One, which essentially removes or eliminates most of the barriers to working from home or accessing corporate assets from home. And so they're doing like pixel browsers now. And, and so transitioning your environment so that maybe all the end user needs to access your, your corporation or your education system or your healthcare is commodity internet. And so it becomes the responsibility of us now as service providers to make sure that that access is seamless and can work over any of those connections that are available to commodity users wherever they may be. Great, okay. I think uh, we'll wrap it up there. That was really interesting. I, I, I very much enjoyed uh, that conversation. I hope everyone else did. So I'd like to thank uh, Michelle, Joel, and Jamin for their time. I'd like to thank everyone who uh, listened to us for your time. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Mark uh, and all the panelists, thank you so much for this uh, presentation, very in-depth great content. It's, it's exciting to, to see in here as we, we, uh, as this evolves. So I'm going to invite, um, to, for our final presentation, Cybera's president and CEO, Dr. Barb Kara. Uh, Dr. Kara earned her master's of science at the university of Calgary and her doctorate in geo geography, geography, sorry, and environmental studies at Wilfrid Laurier University. She served on uh, numerous boards within technology and the not-for-profit uh, sector. So I will throw it to uh, Dr. Kara to uh, close us off with our final presentation. Thank you, Graham, uh, so much for the introduction. And thanks everybody for participating with us over the past two days, it's really been great. So I'm here to introduce MP Goody Hutchings, who was first elected as the Member of Parliament for the riding of Long Range Mountains in Newfoundland and Labrador in 2015. MP Hutchings is a Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Women and Gender, Equality and Rural Economic Development. I hope I got that all right. Um, and prior to this, she served as the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Small Business and Tourism. We are fortunate to have her here today to talk about what the federal government is doing to address rural connectivity in Canada. So thank you so much for joining us today. I don't know what time it is where you are. <laughs> um, so I appreciate you making the effort to come online and support our forum today. Look, it's my pleasure to be here with you, Barb. So I'm saying hello from Western Newfoundland and Labrador. My riding, as you said, is the Long Range Mountains in the beautiful West Coast of Newfoundland and Labrador, home of the Mi'kmaq and Beothic people. And here now it is 10 after seven in the evening. So that's one thing that this new Zoom world has taught us is that we can, you know, we can coordinate our times from coast to coast to coast and make it work. So thanks so much for the invitation and looking forward to having a chat with you. Great. So I was wondering, just to kick things off, if you could tell us a little bit more about your current ro role and uh, portfolio. Okay, great. So as you said, I am Parliamentary Secretary to Minister Monsef, and Miriam is Minister of Women and Gender Equality and Rural Economic Development. So as a Parliamentary Secretary, I support Miriam in delivering for Canadians. And currently our top priority, as I'm sure you've heard us all say, is to get Canadians through COVID-19 and combat this virus and build everything back better. Um, and it's for all Canadians in urban, in rural communities. And uh, we're always committed to a feminist recovery as well. So it's a real honor to support her. And as you alluded to earlier, um, my, in my first role as PS, I was um, tourism and small business. So the two kind of go hand in hand together as well. They really, really do, especially as we tackle those challenges of rural and remote connectivity and, you know, enabling people to participate in the digital economy, especially from a perspective of equality. So that being said, um, just a little bit more about the decision and what led to the decision to create the new Ministry of Rural Economic Development in 2019. Could you speak a little bit to that? That is a great question, Barb, because we don't talk about it enough. Um, we, we recognize, our government recognizes the, need, the unique needs, and I always say unique needs of rural. They need to be addressed, and we created a space at the cabinet table. You know, 30% um, of our GDP comes from rural, and even though people say, yeah, we're, we're, we're a resilient bunch, and I can say that because I'm from a, a very large riding, my land mass is bigger than Switzerland, and I have 200 little communities, um, 
over 200 communities. The largest is 20,000 people and the smallest is 42, right? So by having a seat at the cabinet table, may, we're making sure that our decisions and our policies and our programs have a rural lens and they're tailored to rural communities and address the rural needs, especially as your conversation is all around connectivity. And we know how important connectivity is to health and infrastructure and, and everything. So uh, we recognize that that rural had to be at the table and I'm delighted that we did do that. Yeah, it is, it is really good. So can you also speak to some of the initiatives that uh, rural economic development is undertaken to address connectivity that you can speak to to let the audience know what's, what's going on right now for us? How much time do I have? Because I can <laughs> go on on this one forever. So we have so many tools in our toolbox. Um, Canada is a vast country, as you know, you know, from coast to coast to coast. We've got different geography, different land mass. I live on an island, you know, you've got flat lands and rolling hills and then gorgeous hills on the end. So we, we know we know it's not a one size fits all. So I'm sure you're aware we launched the Universal Broadband Fund last uh, last fall, last November, I believe. And I can tell you, this was a program that Canadians built. And again, from coast to coast to coast, I participated and I know the minister did as well and others in consultations with municipalities, with not-for-profits, with indigenous groups, with business leaders, with small towns, big towns, really remote. And they told us what was right with our earlier programs, what needed to be tweaked and how, what, what was really needed in a connectivity program to help it work for rural. So that was $1.75 billion. And it was the largest program ever invested uh, by previous governments, included all combined, matter of fact. And we're, we're up to now $6.2 billion in programs and projects to connect Canadians to better, faster internet. We've accelerated our goals and we've said, and we're on track to do it, to have 98% of Canada connected by 2026. That's years earlier than we ever thought possible. And my favorite part of the United, of United, the Universal Broadband Fund, was a rapid response stream. And that was a dedicated pot of money for shovel-ready projects to get people connected by November of this year. The uptake in that, I can tell you, was incredible. So it showed that the need was there. It was a quick turnaround. The projects were assessed as soon as they came in. And there are, we've announced projects already and there'll be people connected over the, over the coming weeks for under that program. So we're well underway to our target of connecting all Canadians by uh, 2030, but most by 2026. There's lots of work also being done in Alberta. I should throw that in, seeing as I am in Alberta virtually. Uh, last week, we announced seven projects in Alberta, which was over $5.4 million in federal funding for projects to build high seed internet to over 5,000 underserved households in Northern, Central and Southern Alberta. And in the Starland County in Stetler County, over 7,000 underserved households will be connected by November of this year. And that was a project under the rapid response stream. Oh, that's, that, I mean, that's great to hear. It's good to see that that's moving forward and we're seeing action materialize actually on the ground. <laughs> um, it's always good to see things move forward. So on that, you did mention First Nations communities. And so while you covered a good portion of the, UB, the UBF, the Universal Broadband Fund overview, could you speak specifically about the engagement with First Nation communities? We had a great panel yesterday, still really, you know, focusing from some of those communities talking about that disconnect and the needs we're still seeing in that in that space. So in the Universal Broadband Fund, there was a portion dedicated for mobile projects to connect Indigenous communities. And that was areas like we've referred to as high wave tiers. There are so many sections that don't even have have cell coverage, but also of the million households that we're, we're supporting con connection to across 900 communities, of that 190 of them are Indigenous communities. So we, our goal is to connect all Canadians, and it doesn't matter where you live, urban, remote, Indigenous community, if you live anywhere, our goal is to connect all Canadians. Yeah, thank you so much, MP. So just uh, to follow up on that a little bit, can you speak to I guess, of the current status of the UBF funding that's available, um, that's been allocated, are there still funds out there available for the community to apply for and draw from? Is there, is there more there to be done? 
There is, there is. The, the $1.75 billion that was announced, the rapid response stream was $150 million of that. And like I said earlier, that was outside the typical call of proposals because the projects were assessed and approved as soon as the projects were, so it was out the door getting done. And the, uh, there, we're just under the first stream of, of the UBF. The, the, of what's left and the deadline for the for the first intake is closed but I can tell you there's lots of interest and the department has lots of work to do and I look forward to sharing the great news of other projects to come but yes there will be another uptake coming once they get these these many assessed and I had to give a shout out to the department uh, they've done a phenomenal job of getting this in getting it out and and getting Canadians connected yeah, that's wonderful. Um, on that, so if we start thinking about the future a little bit and where we need to go in terms of long-term legislative changes that we need to undertake as a country and nation to address the digital divide, um, can you talk a little bit about some of the role that you would play with regards to that landscape? And then like, for example, moving away from facilities-based competition to enabling more open network service-based frameworks. So a little bit to that requirement around regulation, legislative changes, the things that you, you touch and control and, and you know, are able to guide from a federal government perspective. You know, and that too was such a good question too. So the pandemic showed us this COVID-19 pandemic. And I always say, no, there wasn't a, there wasn't a playbook for this. You know, uh, you know, we all, I remember when, when they dissolved the house on the 13th of March last year. So a little over a year ago now, we all thought we were going to be back in a few weeks. Uh, little did we know. So there's no pl playbook, but the one thing the COVID pandemic did do, it showed the crucial importance of having strong, reliable networks all across the country from coast to coast to coast. And we've been relentless in promoting competition. We know we've got to lower the prices, but we still have to improve the quality and increase coverage of all the telecom services in Canada. And we're ensuring that Canadians pay fair prices for reliable mobile and wireless networks, regardless of your postal code. And we're going to keep working with the service providers and industry partners to drive investment and make telecommunication services more affordable. And we're going to keep working with the service providers and industry partners to drive investment and make sure telecommunications are more affordable. We'll continue to work with the provinces. And one of the criteria under the UBF is affordability. And when the department assesses the application, that's certainly one of the mainstreams that they're looking at is the affordability piece. Yeah, we know it's not just enough to say it's accessible. It's another thing to recognize the affordability part of the equation as well. Absolutely. Something yep. we constantly talk about here too. Um, I, th there's been some encouragement to post some questions in the chat channel. I'm not sure if you can sure. see that. So we yep. will be following that as we go forward. And maybe I'll just address the first one that's up there, which is uh, from Craig, who says, will there be another round to the UBF if the program is already oversubscribed? So it's just the first part of this part. They've, they've only allocated the first round is, I don't say I don't want to say half the money, Craig, but the the yeah, the first round was I think it was a little more than half. So yes, it's there. And we talk about connectivity all the time. So trust me. And and from every, I think that's one thing. There are a couple of things in the House of Commons we all agree on. This is one of them. We have to connect Canadians. Connectivity is so important for, you know, kids are doing their homework around the kitchen table where many of us are working from home. I had a call last week with a group um, and we're talking about the rural um, need for telehealth and, and the importance for that. You need it for small business. You need it for health and safety. And frankly, you need it to stay connected with your loved ones and keep in touch. So yeah, we know, we know it's going to be addressed and I'm hoping, you know, we all know there's good news coming. We hope in uh, with the budget and who knows if there'll be more there, but, but yeah, the um, it's, it's not, it's the round it was rapid response was oversubscribed, but UBF is still there. Don't worry. Okay. That sounds great. Thanks so much for that. So keep so your applications coming. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna everybody keep their pencils sharpened and ready to go because you know honestly to to make use of those opportunities it does take a lot of coordination and legwork on the ground from local people right figuring out how to submit effort and proposals in that in that space right so in that light one thing that we did with rapid response and it's still active 
they put the Pathfinder service in place. So the Pathfinder service is a 1-800 number and an email where small municipalities and not-for-profits or small ISPs could call and say, I'm looking at connecting blah, blah, blah. Can you tell me, you know, I'm thinking about this in my application. What else do I need? Or can you tell me about this? Their response time was two days. And I don't know the I don't know the uh, the recent numbers, but I know when it, when the uptake started, they were getting like calls every day and and returning them within two days. And I heard from some of my local municipalities what a great service it was. So people who had never done this, and in small communities, you know, I'm sure in Alberta it's the same as in rural Newfoundland and Labrador. You know, you have um, a volunteer town council, you have one or two paid employees. So they're looking at applications they have to fill out and say, oh my golly, where do I go from here? So, you know, the Pathfinder service really showed us how essential that is, especially again for small rural and remote communities to give them that, uh, that, that little help and, and help them and the assistance in, in, along, in along the way. Um, if, if projects weren't successful under rapid response, they then applied under UBF. So it's not like they were turned down and forgotten about. So we're making sure all Canadians get get uh, get connected. The other thing I wanna say is, I don't know how much time I've got. So Barb, I just wanna get so much out with you. People think that all the funds go to the big guns. I can tell you they don't. The Connect to Innovate Fund that we, we just finished up with you know last year, and there's still projects being done, but the, the money was spent. A third of that went to Indigenous communities. A third went to the big ISPs. And a third went to the smaller ISPs. And I'm going to do an announcement in my writing whenever our provincial election gets over, because that's been a, an ongoing thing. And one of the projects is with a small ISP. And he wanted to go into a group of communities that the big guns, frankly, said not interested in going there, but the smaller ISP is. So we're supporting projects of all sizes and okay, all yeah. ISP sizes. That's great to hear because I was going to say that's actually one of maybe the questions that were here posed on the chat channel, which was the percentage. And I know you probably can't speak to the percentage, but it really is that balance between the large the big guns, as you called them, the large ISPs and telco providers versus, you know, the local newer companies that are trying to get off the ground that support, you know, that economic development piece in our, in our more local regions. So, and that's yeah. another tool in our toolbox too, is of course the Canadian Infrastructure Bank. So that's there, there's a, there's a chunk of money put aside from there. And that is for the big players to go in and partner with to do the big mega projects. So like I said, our toolbox has so many things, you know, from low earth satellites to UBF to the rapid response to the Canadian Infrastructure Bank. We're a diverse country and we've got a bunch of diverse tools in our toolbox to get everybody connected. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So we just wrapped up a panel before you joined us on low earth orbit satellites. And so I was wondering if you would feel comfortable speaking to how you think Low Earth Orbit satellites will change the connectivity landscape in Canada from a well, rural economic development perspective, right? Oh, look, we need connectivity. And I can go on about rural, rural economic development with and how important connectivity is to that, too. But, you know, we, we have parts of our country that are so vast and so out there in, in my home province of Newfoundland and Labrador. I think of the northern parts of Labrador, you know, accessible by a boat only, limited air coverage. They are truly remote and would be a contractor's nightmare if you talked about fiber. So that's why we need the low earth, or LEOs, I call them, right? And, you know, we're focused on a... Oh. Goody, I'm uh, sorry, MP Hutchins, I think you muted yourself by accident. <laughs> okay. Or maybe somebody oh, no. did. <laughs> please call me Goody, please. please oh, okay, please. sorry, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I didn't misspeak. Actually, it was my team who accidentally muted you, so I apologize. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I usually don't have any trouble talking, but if, if I'm talking too much, tell your team to mute me for sure, right? But, you know, we, we and our government provided $85 million in funding to the Telsats low earth orbit, orbit satellites, right? And we're gonna support innovative solutions like that because they're world leaders in the field and it creates highly skilled jobs also right here in, New, in, in Canada. And again, it shows our focus on improving the quality coverage and the price, right? And like I said, I keep saying that we need all kinds of tools in our toolbox. And I'm so glad that low earth orbit, my God, you say that one 10 times, eh? Low earth orbit satellites are part of our tools. 
Yeah, no, exactly. Thank you so much for that. So um, a quick question on uh, the chat that was filtered to me from the moderator was around digital literacy. And I know digital literacy does play a role. Um, you know, when we think about enabling technology, getting people up to speed on actually how to use it and participating, and we think about government services and the delivery of everything we're trying to achieve by enabling citizens to participate in the digital economy. Any thoughts there on the role of the Rural Economic Development uh, Ministry and your perspective on, on digital literacy to support so that? that that is excellent. And I can tell you that we have had many conversations about that in, in many different groups. With my other hat that I wear, Women, Gender Equality, uh, sadly throughout the pandemic, we've seen the, the um, rates of abuse rise. And as much as we say we're going to connect every Canadian, it comes down to them. Yeah, we're going to connect every community, but is every Canadian going to have the tools and the capability to use this? So one thing that you're seeing some of the internet service providers provide in their applications is to have, and I, I tell this story all the time, when I went to school, I'll tell my age now, my mom always used to put a quarter in my book bag that if you needed to use a pay phone, you had a quarter to make a call. Well, we don't have pay phones anymore. So what's the modern day version of that? So is it supporting, and I have seen some of this in, in some of the um, applications for smaller rural areas, to have whatever that new internet hub is. And in that, help people, help seniors, help people who don't have the means to do this. Or God forbid you have a, someone in an abusive relationship or a child that wants to reach out to their grandparents, that there is a place in the community, be it in their library or their town hall, or run in a church basement, that people can go and learn the skills. There's another neat thing that, that we've seen of, um, of projects, and uh, I'm sure you've heard of our um, New Horizons seniors projects, you know, which is grant programs to help seniors. Um, I awarded one of my writing, and it was for a youth group to go teach seniors how to use basic computer skills, right? So, you know, how to do basic online things, and of course, you know, Facebook or FaceTime, whatever you want to do, but also show them how to do some of the skills because that's so important for going forward. It's, it's one thing to say we're going to connect everyone, but if people don't have the means or a secure device or have the skill set to use it, we need to, to work at, at all of that. And I'm glad to see that it is being addressed in some of the applications that we're receiving now under rapid response and UBF. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Yeah, thanks for that uh, response to that question. There's also been some suggestions over the last couple of days and a lot of really uh, keen engagement and dialogue around suggestions of, you know, a university connect, or universal connectivity plan. Um, and it's sometimes called different things, whether it's, you know, the national broadband strategy, we talk a lot about the need for a provincial broadband strategy. Um, but, you know, it's really about making sure that connectivity is you know, they're accessible, affordable, enabled for everybody, regardless of geographic location. And then we're speaking a lot to this, you know, as really a basic right, which we know is, is moving forward from, you know, the perspective of all the investment that we're, we're pushing into this because we see it as a real thing. Any thoughts on that around how you know, best to coordinate all this, you know? Well, Minister Monsef has a great line and she says, you know, years ago, John A. McDonald, connected our country with a railroad. And that railroad has now changed to broadband, right? So it's how do we get everybody connected with great service? And you folks know better than I do, you know, the magic, the magic scale is 5010 now. We all know as soon as we get everybody to 5010, that's going to be outdated. And I want to make sure that when we make investments with taxpayers' money, that we're you we're putting it in in in, in projects that can be scalable so that they can scale up and add to the, you know, whatever the new norm is going to be, you know, like years ago, I remember, you know, my son is 30. I remember you had one desktop in your home and everybody shared it. And, you know, now everybody's got a, in, in every home, there's two or three devices. So it's how do we make sure that that's addressed, but again, addressed for all. And your earlier question about, you know, literacy and everybody, you know, making sure that they have the tools and the skill set to use this to everybody's best knowledge, you know, um, the conversation I had last week with a group of medical people, it was like, it was how it's going to cut back on the cost of, of rural health delivery, 
But then again, it's making sure that there is a technician or a nurse there or someone to help the person walk through the process so that they're doing it the right way so they're getting the best results. So there's a whole new opportunity in rural economic development for helping these red phone booth connectivity hubs or whatever we're going to call them, right? So it is um, it is coming. Uh, I won't say it's, it's cast in stone of what it's going to be, but remember, we need the provinces and territories to come to the table too, right? And um, the, the more partners and players we can get to come, we'll just get everybody connected even faster. Yeah, that is a really great point. It does. And that's come up quite a few times over the past two days as well, which is the, the role and in, in concept around partnerships. Super important. So there is one question on the chat channel that I'll, that I'll ask you quickly too. Is, is there an opportunity to incentivize utility providers? So you mentioned the railway. Well, I sometimes think about you know the original phone distributions um, of the early days uh, to contribute and fill the gaps in infrastructure. You think about our current electricity grids uh, and, and the fact that all yep. of our homes have access to electricity. Can we leverage some of those or incentivize some of those partnerships or opportunities? Well, I think we have to, and it, and that's part of the discussion too in the various provinces of who owns utility poles. So who owns that passive infrastructure that instead of if you're, Barb, if you have a, you know, or a small ISP, you know, how can we make sure that some of this and much of it is put there with taxpayers' money? How can we all use that for the betterment of all? And I think they're the conversations and you'll see that each each of those conversations is different in every province. But yeah, that's how we that's how we make all this work for for everybody, right? Yeah, exactly. So any final thoughts or words to share with the group? We would really appreciate them. And what I would like to ask is, what do you need from us? Like partners on the ground, you have a willing audience who want to do things. What can we do to help? Keep talking about it and think outside the box. Like when this small ISP said to me, when they heard me go on about my, my, my phone booth story, and they said, well, you know what? We're going to put that in our proposal because they were connecting small communities of two, 300 people. And they said, you know what? We can build that in because every small community has a library or a town hall or a legion or a Lions club or whatever. And they said, we're going to build that in. So encourage people to think outside the box. Encourage people to use the Pathfinder service if they have a question. Um, and we need to be connected, right? And it's just not enough to connect people physically. It, it, it's got to be affordable too. And that's the message that we've got to drive out there, right? And especially in rural and remote areas, right? And, you know, of all the falls I've worked on, this is the most exciting because you see the benefits, you see the long-term benefits for our rural areas in, in, in driving the economy, be it, you know, I had a conversation with some farmers the other day and they're all excited when it's coming to this area that they're in because of all the new digital equipment and they want, they need to be wireless in order to avail of all this stuff. The same as fisheries. Look at safety with our Coast Guard. Look at safety if you get broken down on the side of a road. Like I said, healthcare, uh, education, business and everything. But frankly, in this time of COVID, I think the best way we need to be connected now is for our own mental health and to connect with our family and friends. This has been a difficult time, folks. And like I said, nobody, um, and as much as Zooms are great and we all love them, I can't wait, frankly, so we can meet face to face. There'd been nothing better than if I was able to, to come to Alberta and have a chat and partake in your, in your conference. And who knows, maybe we can do that another year, another time. But please reach out anytime. Uh, if you have any questions, don't be shy. Uh, we're all here to get Canada connected. You folks are passionate about it. So thanks for the work that you're doing. And if you have any suggestions, send them our way. Thank you so much for joining us today, MP Hutchings. It's been great to have you. Um, it's looking... Goody, please. It's Sorry, Goody. Okay, thank you, Goody. <laughs> I work for you. Don't forget that. I very much appreciate that. It's been a great dialogue. Thanks for being so engaging and um, you know, working hard on this file with all of us. Great. My pleasure. And everyone, stay safe and take care. Bye now. Bye. <laughs>
Rural Connectivity Forum. And what I really also want to do is say thank you to the original Digital Future Symposiums, because it really was that platform of engagement that brought many of the participants here today that have been involved for many, many years in these conversations. And I really do think our uh, MP Hutchings made some great points around continuing the dialogue. And from a Cybera perspective and from the Alberta Rural Connectivity Coalition Group, really carrying that conversation forward is super important to us that we keep bringing people to the table and advancing the agenda and the conversation as we move forward. I also want to say a big thank you to the teams for putting this together, all the people involved in the background, um, as well as Graham for playing moderator and MC over the past couple of days. You've done a great job, Graham. Uh, thank you for keeping us on track and on time. Please check out the Alberta Rural Connectivity Coalition's website and please consider signing up to the coalition to continue to advocate for universal connectivity in Alberta. We want to thank everybody for their continuing support and taking time out of your days and schedules to join us. We'll be following up with a lot of information and emails um, and presentations online as they become available. And I think with that, I'll wrap it all up and, and wish everybody a good night.